Thank you, um, Fiona, and good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's an honor as a, a veteran mining engineer to be invited to the ESG Inquisition, and uh, I'm definitely going to enjoy it. Before I, I start my presentation, I'd like to pay tribute to the SAMESG committee, now led by Teresa steele Scober and previously led by Sarah Dyke, who's um, been, become uh, Sarah Magnus uh, since her time in uh, South Africa. The 2017 edition, uh, edition leads the world in ESG reporting guidelines and was recognized as such by the United Nations Intergovernmental Working Group of experts on international standards of accounting and reporting, uh, known by the acronym of ISAR. And that was a prestigious award, which was presented to SAMES in, in Geneva late last year. In the, the lead up to COP26, there is obviously a plethora of standards and guidelines on all manners of topics um, associated with ESG, and in particular, you will all know climate change and the race to net zero carbon emissions. However, we are in the position where there is not one single global reporting standards that um, uh, st our stakeholders can refer to. I believe what uh, SAM codes has to do is incorporate a comprehensive set of ESG guidelines into the SAMREC code in line with international best practice. And these guidelines will in some instances be maybe South African specific, but in general um, should be applicable globally. To that end, we in South Africa are watching developments with regards to ESG uh, matters in Europe through the PERC uh, organization, in Australasia through JORC, and in Canada and the US. Um, and once all these are complete, the, um, they will um, be then, we'll look at the best of, of those and take the revisions into the, uh, the Crisco template. What I um, um, intend to do is to just look at um, the definition and the requirements of um, for ESG. Then I will look at four projects which um, in the past have had serious issues with ESG. And then having looked at those projects, I will propose a possible solution in the form of integrated risk management. ESG, and um, it was in previous forums uh, on this subject that um, I suggested that maybe we should define what is the G in ESG and ask the question, was it limited to social governance or did it embrace the greater corporate governance? Um, because you'll notice it isn't ESCG, it's ESG. And um, in South Africa, we have the benefit of the uh, King 4 report, um, which sets out a code of corporate governance. And companies in South Africa are also bound by the Companies Act of 2008, and in particular, Regulation 43, which requires uh, a company to have a social and ethics committee, which has to provide oversight on the following areas. 
Now I won't I won't um, read these out, um, but this is a summary of what is is required. And then in that regulation 43, it is very specific on human rights, environmental protection, prevention of corruption, remedy of racial disparities, community development, and the support of charity. Obviously, some of these requirements um, are South African specific, but not many of them. So to me, it's, um, it's clear that the G requires reporting on cor corporate governance uh, in, its, in, uh, in its broadest, and in South Africa, it's well-defined uh, sense. I would like to raise a, a, um, a point here on, um, you know, having given the recent events in South Africa and, and also in many Southern African countries, I would suggest that there is also need to report on the governance at uh, national level and how that impacts on, um, on mining projects and, and the mining industry. I've included at the bottom of that slide a reference to um, a book or a publication entitled Corporate Governance, the Director's Guide, fifth edition. And that's uh, a book that's very well worth reading uh, as we go into this uh, rewrite of the of the SAMREC code with regards to ESG. The, the requirements on the left there for the under environment are obviously uh, pretty clear, but uh, it's the subject of serious debate, of, as you've seen. And uh, some of the big questions will be whether we have to disclose greenhouse gas emission targets uh, or metrics and, and um, and whether it's going to be scope one and two emissions or scope one, two and three. And obviously there'll be much debate on this in the coming weeks as we go into COP26. I, I, um, I, I won't express an opinion on, on this, but other to say that um, it's very difficult to set hard and fast targets when you're faced with so many uncertainties. Now, if I go on to um, my next point, um, in preparation for today, I went back to a presentation I gave uh, uh, in October 2014 to the Mongolian Professional Institute of Geosciences and Mining, the acronym there you can see MPIGM. And that was in uh, Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia. And it was my task as part of the Crisco delegation there to keep my view on what was required in a reporting standard in terms of environmental and social modifying factors. And you can see the, the term governance didn't, um, uh, didn't appear on that slide. Um, and then um, I was obviously leaning very heavily in that presentation on the, the original SAMESC guidelines, which had uh, just been developed. In that presentation, I went to the World Economic Forum and they had issued in 2013, the top 10 global risks. And um, I'm going to read through them, but as I read through them, I want you to just envisage South Africa today. This was in 2013, and it was applicable to, to, um, to the globe. Fiscal, the top risk was the fiscal crisis in key economies. Structural high unemployment and underemployment. Water crises. Severe income disparity failure of climate change mitigation and adaptation, greater incidence of extreme weather events, global governance failure, food crises, um, failure of a major financial mechanism or institution, 
profound political and social instability. When revisiting these risks in a COVID-laden 2021, one has to ask what is what has changed. So I went um, after that through four examples of projects which demonstrated that all was not well in the realms of ESG and demonstrated the need for more detailed reporting requirements when reporting mineral reserves and mineral resources. And when you look at these uh, examples, which I'm going to show you, you will probably say, why didn't I use current day examples, of which unfortunately there are many. My answer to that is that some of the current examples are extremely sensitive and not yet concluded, so I, I'm better to leave them well alone. The first project um, was uh, Rosie Montana. That was um, a proposed open pit gold and silver project in Romania. The village um, has a history of over two millennia and it hosts Roman mining galleries and architecture spanning centuries. Gabriel Resources from Canada had the major 80% shareholding. Approximately 250 million US dollars had been spent on the project. The protest was against the use of cyanide in the metallurgical process and the deposition of cyanide rich tailings de being deposited in the valley of the corner river, which would have to be diverted. And the possibility was there that it would destroy a rich heritage of the underground workings and water pollution was obviously a key issue. Protests began in 2013 and in July 2021, UNESCO named the Romanian ancient gold mine settlement a World Heritage Site. Does that sound familiar? The second one is the Pascua Lama project high in the Andes on the border of Chile and Argentina, which you can see outlined in red on the, uh, on the map. The project in 2006 was the subject of an online petition imploring the Chilean government to prevent the project from obtaining authorization uh, because of the environmental and social consequences of the mining operation. Late in 2017, the Barrick um, Gold project remained on hold. Barrick had spent approximately 5 billion US dollars of Pascu Lama's 8.5 billion capital planned expenditure. September 2020, Chile, Chile's Environmental Protection Agency ordered the total and definitive closure of the Pasquillama project. Water, one of the key issues. Protests by local communities regarding the potential pollution of their water supplies resulted in the Chilean court suspending the license on the project and preventing development. Now, if we go to the, um, to the Philippines, you will see the, the tailings facility, uh, a major environmental disaster occurred at the Felix uh, copper gold mine in Bengue in um, the Philippines. And you can see the extent of the, the fill in the top left hand corner as it went into the, the river. The tailings facility wall breached into the Balog Creek and 20 million tons of tailings found its way into the Agno River. Again, pollution of water. Felix were ordered to pay 1 billion uh, Philippine pesos, which is equivalent to 20 million US dollars. And in today's um, world, that doesn't seem like a lot of money. 
And the final project is um, is um, in Congo, uh, in Peru, um, the development of the Congo Gold Project in Peru was suspended in 2011 by Newmont. Opponents went as far as vandalizing the mine site and kidnapping a worker. Local communities protested again about the threat to their water supply. Newmont said at the time that they were unlikely to make a decision on restarting until 2015. In April uh, 2016, Newmont walks away from its 5 billion copper and gold project in Peru. It reclassifies its reserves to resources. Peru's government had to hire, uh, to hire international consultants to determine the viability of a revised water strategy proposed by Newmont. Eventually, authorities decided to order suspension of all work at the site, except for the construction of water reservoirs. I presented this infographic to, to the meeting there and uh, to give some indication of the cost of these kind of interruptions to projects. And you can see in those, and this is 2014, uh, uh, in an early exploration, it was uh, an interruption was cost you $10,000 a day. To When you were in um, advanced exploration or beginning mine development, $50,000 a day and up to 20 million per week uh, when you're during advanced uh, uh, development or you're in operation. This, of course, does not uh, say what the cost may be to other stakeholders, such as governments in terms of taxes, local communities and suppliers in terms of jobs and business. Now, this quantification, and it was mentioned yesterday how you quantify it, it's all well and, and good. But in three of the cases that I described, the projects were eventually aborted. So there has to be another way of reporting that gives the reader the confidence that all residual risks are manageable. And that uh, obviously includes re residual risks in the realms of uh, ESG. Now, this is what I, I call my I told you so um, slide, which maybe I shouldn't have put on. But um, as part of my concluding remarks, uh, I urged the uh, Crisco members to address the social, uh, environmental and social modifying factors. Um, and, in, and incorporate them into their, their respective codes. Otherwise, um, others would do it for us. And that, unfortunately, despite our best efforts, is exactly what is happening. Now, to get on to my proposed solution um, for this is that... Um, my suggestion that uh, uh, an integrated um, risk management um, analysis and management is undertaken. And how you do this is that um, you take a multidisciplined approach and that covers all disciplines, not just a, a narrow few. That where the high risks are identified and when those high risks are identified, you then put in mitigating actions and everybody, you know, all the disciplines are involved with that. And then um, we come with a re the, the residual risks are then described to the, to the reader. My experience with risk assessments uh, and management risk management is that they tend to be discipline specific. For example, in the dark and distant past, the risk assessments would be limited to the geologist and the geostatistician and maybe the mining engineer. Uh, and the confidence in the estimates was catered for by 
classifying into measured, indicated, or inferred. And then it was also reasonably, uh, relatively easy to adjust the discount rates used in the evaluation. Things have uh, obviously improved since then, but true integration is still, in my opinion, some, um, some way off. Now, most of the examples that I used in the projects were to do with uh, water. So the following slide indicates the kind of multidiscipline approach that I am suggesting on the subject of the water balance for a mining project. Now the water balance is basically the management of water resources in and around the mine. It will indicate whether the mine will need to import water or will discharge water to the local waterways. Most importantly, it will tell you what effect you're going to have on the quality and quantity of the water on which the local communities depend. And um, this is um, what I'm talking about, uh, the water balance. And if you, if you I've, I think I've got um, 11 disciplines in there. And um, I'll, I'll tell you about the 12th one when I, when I come to the end of it. Um, but we would have the disciplines, geohydrologists, obviously, the study, who studies the groundwater and its effect on the physical environment, the hydrologist who looks at the movement of groundwater uh, between aquifers, the environmental scientist, look, a scientist looking at the effect on biodiversity and the environment as a whole, obviously the social scientists, which would, um, would um, be look at the effect on the uh, dependent population and would be responsible for a lot of the communication around this process. The mining engineer is still there. Uh, he would be looking at water usage in terms of uh, how much water, tons of water you use per ton of uh, rock produced. In recent years, those figures have gone sky high. The geologist would be there to look at the um, structural geology and would assist identifying the movement of the groundwater through the um, aquifers. The ventilation engineer who would look at the cooling requirements, how much chilled water is required. The mechanical and electrical engineer would be looking at the pumping and piping in the in the shafts and uh, in the open pits. Uh, the civil engineer for the design of water dams and storage, the storage capacity. The met metallurgist or the process engineer would be uh, looking at uh, in, uh, how much filtration was going to be um, undertaken, what the density of the um, tailings is going to be going out to the tailings dam. The water usage um, uh, the tailings engineer will be looking at the water usage, the discharge, the reuse, and uh, uh, most importantly, at the, with the tailings um, engineer, looking at the zone of influence of that uh, tailings uh, deposit. Uh, yeah, deposit. And then the one that I added, uh, I almost forgot it was the legal representative. His most important that uh, he's on there but uh, it may be a bit expensive, so you won't always get him on the, on the team. And then yesterday, after I listened to Kevin Davis, I had to, I had to uh, admit that I'd left out the accountant. And after uh, Kevin's um, um, presentation yesterday, we should include the chart of the council, then, you know, they informed as to what's going on. Now, it is important that this type of integrated risk analysis and management is conducted early in the exploration phase, during the development, during the operation, and at mine closure. And even more important is that the communities in and around the mine 
and the mine projects are consulted and informed on an ongoing basis of the risk analysis and the risk management. And that concludes my presentation. I just want to leave you with this slide, which I thought, well, gives food for thought. And as my projects were all involved uh, with water or about water, number six uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations is clean water and sanitation. And remind you that there are 2 billion people around the world who do not have access to safe drinking water. So we have got an enormous job uh, ahead of us. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Roger, um, for, that, for that interesting keynote address. Does anyone have any questions? We, have, we, have, we do have two minutes for questions, if anyone has a question for Roger. Morning, Fiona and Roger. It's Theresa here from SEMESC. Um, I just wanted to say, Roger, thanks. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation and thanks for, the, for your contributions to SEMESC um, because we've had lots of really good discussions and, uh, and the support of yourself and many others has made you know, SEMESC the guideline that it is and that we, we're working towards achieving with the next edition. So just to, to acknowledge that and say thank you for your support. Thanks. Uh, Roger. Um, as Fiona, I have a random question about uh, drinking water um, and the input from the mining sector, because we've discussed a lot about um, prevention of contamination of drinking water, but are there any stats on how, 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 what a positive impact the mining industry has had on on drinking water through development? There, 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 there are statistics available on, um, in South Africa um, and probably the world on the, the number of people who have access to clean water. And um, from, from those statistics, you can see where there are trends around mining mining company areas or mining areas. Um, I haven't got them at my uh, fingertips, but uh, there are statistics available on that. Okay, thank you. I Roger, might call morning. You. Roger, morning, it's Bruce Williamson here. Um, just a question, at that early stage when consultants and mining companies um, start the project and engage with the community, do they include government representatives to also be part of that, that picture? I would say they don't, Bruce, but uh, it may be a good idea uh, to include them at that early stage as well. Um, I see we have one more question. If it's a quick question, we can just, uh, we can just fit it in. If you'd like to to raise your question now. Uh, yes, I have just a, an insight because I am new in this business. Hello, my name is Linda and I'm from Wits University and I'm teaching mining geologists to the third year uh, mining engineers. And I'm going through the ESG uh, when I go through the modifying factor. And since uh, you, Roger, have a lot of experience, what would you like that I teach to these future mining engineers that they are coming to the industry? The, the future mining engineer is going to have to be, um, first and foremost, is going to have, have to be, uh, well, we're assuming that the um, mining engineer is going to, well, it's not always going to be the case. The, the manager of these operations is going to become a man of all trades is going to have to become a statesman and won't always be a mining engineer, I don't think. So the profile of the of the of the guy that leads or the lady that leads these operations is, is going to change and it's going to be able to have to address all these um, other issues. Uh, 
uh, and principally the ESG issues, he's got to be a statesman. And, um, and that's why I'm proposing that multidisciplinary approach. They all have to have their input into defining those risks and putting into and and um, and mitigating those th those risks. And we, we, we saw yesterday, or we heard yesterday, even the SEC is um, looking to a risk-based approach in this reporting of um, ESG matters. I hope that answers okay. the question. Um, yes. If I can, thank you very much, Roger. Uh, we've run over a little bit, we're a couple of minutes over now, so I'm gonna stop the, the questions there. If there are any more questions, please address them to Roger in the chat. Um, we're gonna move, thank you so much, Roger. You can stop sharing now. Yes. We're gonna move on to our uh, discussion panels now. And so Clements, if you're there, if you can, Roger, if you can just stop sharing your screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the button, the button, yeah. Okay, great. Clements, can you start sharing your screen, please? So I don't actually have a presentation, but today um, we've got four speakers. So I'll just quickly introduce them. And what we really wanted to do is-, is Okay, give, let me, um, yeah. So yeah. let me just introduce you then. So you don't have right. any, any slides. So we're just gonna move on to our, to our panel discussion sections. Um, and Clements McNulty is gonna, gonna lead us through the discussion on how companies deal with, deal with sustainability and ESG reporting. So it's over to you, Clements. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. And, and um, lovely to be um, here and, and thanks for the presentation, Roger. It was certainly interesting and a good segue, I think, to some of the, the items we'd like to speak about today. So as I mentioned, we've got um, four speakers um, for this panel. Um, and we thought um, when we discussed the topic that it would be great to share a couple of different perspectives, um, lenses of around um, companies are approaching the topic. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quickly just um, explain the, the, the four different lenses and then and then hand over to, to the various speakers. And then we'll be sure to leave some time for, for a Q&A. Um, so first of all, we've got Zach Wood, um, and, and Zach is really going to talk about the risk lens and the risk perspective and, and, and the risk drivers, um, certainly um, supporting enhanced ESG reporting. And then Raylene um, Watson is, is going to share the perspective maybe more from the investor lens um, and the expectations of investors in, in relation to ESG reporting. And then we've got Herman Cornelison. He's going to speak more about the operational lens um, and the fact that through ESG reporting there are certainly lots of opportunities to improve our operational performance which can obviously have significant um, benefits as well. Um, and finally Peter Williamson is going to share um, the, the company view on the ground and um, his approach um, to, to managing both internal and external expectations around ESG reporting. Um, so I'm going to hand over and now to Zach, if you're here, and I think Zach may have a couple of um, slides to, to share, and then we'll just go uh, around um, Zach, Raylene, Herman, and, and Peter, and then we'll, we'll gather back for a bit of a panel discussion. Brilliant. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Clemence. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I uh, um, uh, thank you for, for giving us this opportunity today, I guess. Um, as Clement says, what I'm going to talk about is really from a risk perspective, uh, why we do a lot of this reporting. And, and uh, I think it ties in very nicely to what Roger's just uh, just explained to us or just spoken about, about this concept of multidisciplinary and, and multi-views. And I'm going to do it through a bit of a story. Um, so uh, I've been involved in mining projects for a number of years um, and have had a couple of interesting engagements and some lessons and I think you know at the end of the day for most of us what we're really interested in is digging a hole. Uh, we want to get out there and dig a hole and get some stuff out that's going to make a bunch of money and um, and that's really often the focus. 
Uh, and I, when I was putting this together, I was reminded of some years ago, um, I was doing some work for a mining company that had just bought a diamond mine. And I was with the diamond guys, training them on the project management methodology that we used, et cetera, and how, how all of that worked. And about a day in, one of the guys stopped me and he said, well, I said, hang on a second, mate. We don't need all of this. I mean, we find some indicator minerals. We find a Kimberlite pipe. As long as we dig, we're going to make money. Why do we have to worry about the rest of this? And, uh, you know, it was a, a, a tough one to answer. But but the fact is, and I mean, I think Roger's brought it up. And, you know, when we look at those top WEF risks that Roger brought up, we have to be looking just beyond digging the hole. You know, so we dig the hole then. Then we're going to go and we've got to look at water, where are we getting our water from and how does that come in? And so that's another report and that's another document and that's another study that we've got to do. And then we've got to go look at, well, what impact are we having on the uh, on the environment? Or, you know, how, how are we impacting uh, um, the local landmass? Uh, and then that's another report. And then where are we getting our power from? And uh, what are we doing to downstream you know, downstream water supplies and where's our transport coming from and all of that's another report and then we got to talk about communities in the area and our social impact and and all of that is a another report and I think quite a lot of this becomes our way of trying to fill in the gaps of this picture you know there's this picture that's largely hidden from us but we we're trying to understand it trying to get an image of it and of course as we go through and we're now talking about our biodiversity and we try and study this to a greater and greater and greater level, which is exactly what uh, what Roger was talking about, about bringing in these multiple disciplines. But we're trying to break down in each of these disciplines, where are the bits that we're missing out of this picture? And of course, we're still missing stuff from this picture because we haven't yet considered the big glacier sitting off to the side of our mine. And you know, we need to keep uh, understanding this um, from a risk perspective, that what we are trying to do is draw this imperfect picture and understand what this imperfect picture is. Um, uh, and of course, if we get it wrong, we know that the impacts are significant. Uh, we've we've seen protests, and I mean, Roger's just spoken about a bunch of them, but we've seen protests all over the world that have stopped mining projects, that have delayed mining projects, that have really impacted us. Um, and uh, and cost the industry, I mean, billions and billions and billions of dollars over, over the years. Uh, you know, and, and I think a number of anyone here who's who's been involved in the mining industry for long enough will have been involved in a project somewhere that's gone completely pear-shaped um, and has ended up costing a fortune more and almost always due to things that we just didn't see. And so I think all of this comes down to, and all the reporting comes down to, how do we draw this imperfect picture of our, our uncertain future. And, and that, I guess, is my comment or setup for the discussion that we're about to have, is that whichever reporting standards we use, and we may use many, and they may feel onerous, and they may sometimes be bureaucratic, um, but in the back of our minds, what we've always got to have is the fact that we're drawing this picture and we're trying to fill that in. And so we're trying to get a good view of risk at the moment that we are doing reporting purely for compliance uh, purposes, we've we've lost it, um, and uh, and then we will we will almost certainly miss what's underlying it. And so, you know, we we talk a lot these days uh, about using reporting and using our uh, using some kind of framework to draw together ESG into the economic consideration fold. I think. Historically, and again, I'm, I'm sure that we've all experienced this, we, we would consider projects from an economic perspective and we would look at a resource and say, is that economically viable? Um, but we focus so much on what is the economic contribution, what's the impact there, that we ignore the E in ESG, or we might say, let's consider this economically, and then, okay, well, we'll, we'll kind of use ESG as our, uh, as our stage gate or as a last check we have to draw that together. We have to bring that into a single framework and a single uh, unified view. Um, and so, uh, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of different ways. We like the ESGs, uh, uh, sorry, the SDGs um, for bringing, bringing them all together. But, uh, you know, there's many, many ways to, uh, to slice up this pie. 
and to understand how this could work, the concept remains the same. And I think it's the same thing that Roger was saying is we need to structurally bring together multiple disciplines, multiple approaches, multiple lenses, multiple views in a way that uh, is cogent and makes sense across all of the different aspects of our industry and be able to compare apples for apples across those, which can be difficult, but, uh, but certainly there's a, a lot of good work out there and a lot of concepts and, and uh, ideas that, that exist and ways that we can do this. And yeah, the, the last thought I'll leave you with is really that, that whatever you're doing, wherever you're reporting, whenever you're considering anything to do with the mine, I mean, it's important that in the back of your mind, you remember that there's a, there's a greater picture uh, at stake. And how do we try to unpack and uncover what that great picture is? I'm going to stop there. I'm going to hand over to uh, Tomas. Should I come back to you or go straight to Raleen? No, I think just let's go straight to Raleen and, and let's keep the flow going. Yeah, thanks. All right. I'm not sure that Raleen has made it in. So I'm hoping, Herman, you might be able to step in and maybe we'll just um, get Raleen in. Maybe she had some connection issues. I'll try and, and, and figure it out. If you're there, Herman. Good morning, Clemence. Yes, I am. Uh, just allow me to start the video. My name is Herman Cornelissen, and I'm um, a consultant working for DMT Kai Butler in Randburg. Um, and what I'd like to do today is to share with you some of my experience. Until the end of 2019, I was the head of sustainable development for a small state-owned enterprise. And in that capacity, I was charged with uh, the water and carbon footprint. So what I'd like to do is I mean, yesterday we heard from a, a, a quite a number of speakers about the various perspectives on ESG reporting and the value that it has for shareholders and for organizations, both locally and internationally, and also for from the accounting world. We've had a, a very wide range of views on, on ESG reporting and the value of that. And what I'd like to do in the presentation today, and in keeping with the topic, is to, to bring that home to a smaller organization. What do you do and what can you do? Um, so with that, and hopefully without further drama from my, uh, from my uh, presentation skills, um, let's, let's see how far we can get. So yesterday we saw that there's a general need to improve the understanding of what ESG reporting is. And I think Roger made a, a, a very, Siding insight to, to the world of or, or to the value of ESG reporting and understanding the, 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 the need for the perception of accurate reporting in the communities by attaching a value to, to getting it wrong. And, 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 and you made a very, very insightful point to say that if you don't do that, someone else will do it on your behalf. So with that, um, it's, it's, it's very important to keep in mind, but of course, We've seen that the value of responsible corporate approach to ESG reporting um, to, to investors and shareholders is well established by the reporting foundations, the investment houses, and the accounting fraternity. We also heard from Sarah Gordon, I think yesterday, um, one of the very first speakers, who said that you have a forest of standards that is, that is massive and potentially confusing. So the question becomes, where, where does a small or a junior company start? Perhaps you don't have the resources to, to to deal or to tackle with this entire wealth of, of, of um, guidelines out there, even to read the things would be a massive undertaking. So here with uh, my experience uh, with some basic aspects of ESG reporting, if that helps to set you on the right path. Um, I was the head of sustainable development for a small state-owned enterprise until the end of 2019. Um, and in that capacity, I produced the carbon and water footprint reports for the organization since 2011. Um, the first carbon footprint report we completed in 2011 and every year after that. And at the time when we did it, there was no stakeholder pressure to do it. We really are, uh, were a small state-owned enterprise. And I mean, there, there was still no regulatory pressure or anything of the kind in, in our country, at least to to, uh, to do the, the carbon footprint reports and those sorts of things. So it started out as a question of board interest, of curiosity, someone on the board saying, but what is our carbon footprint, by the way, because we run smelters and other sorts of energy intensive processes. So at the time we used the greenhouse gas reporting codes before the Department of Environmental Affairs then regulated using the IPC standards. 
And like many companies, we considered using a third party. Um, but the consideration was that if we used a consultant to do this for us, uh, just to, to, to tick the box or to answer to the board's question, we wouldn't learn in the process in the first place. And of course, the cost was fairly high. So we allocated a bit of time and, and spent energy doing this in-house. Um, and through the process starting in 20, starting a decade ago, we had several years of consistent reporting and it prepared the company for later regulations, which is valuable in itself. And through that also, it added significant tangible value to the organization through a better understanding of the operation and of cost saving and energy inputs. Um, the results obtained from our first carbon footprint um, our first report taught us the methods that we had to use to do that foot, footprint report and where to find the required data to report. That in itself can be a fairly time consuming exercise. And once you figure out who has data about your organization and why they keep it, it can make your life a lot easier for the next time around, if I, if I could put it in simple terms like that. So, but what it also enabled us to do is for the very first time, we had a simple view of where the energy we were buying was going and what impact our soft business activities had. So, so that was valuable in itself. Um, and, and, and I must say, I mean, it wasn't all smooth sailing. The, the need to report in the first place and the reporting channel was not even clear. We ended up doing this report and sticking it in the annual report. So it's a matter of public record at the moment, and that's why I can speak about it. Um, these, these, these things are available um, to, to, to read for anyone. Um, it, but it also generated internal interest at the executive and at the board level to start asking hard questions about we, in, in, in the context of we're paying money for this energy, what are we doing with it? And can't we save money if we start using our energy a bit more intelligently? Um, it also then resulted in operational changes based on an improved understanding of energy flows in the organization. And that resulted in real savings in terms of energy and emissions and started a bit of a competitive trend internally to, to reduce those on, on an ongoing basis. And of course, we made subsequent refinements to this reporting on an, on an annual basis. Again, this is just one aspect of what is a full suite of the SDGs. Um, it's it's the, the carbon footprint reporting. So um, just to put a bit of graphic to there, because my presentation is very text heavy um, and, and it really carries quite a simple message, but the the this is what we managed to do. And this is still according to the old greenhouse gas reporting standard, but from 2011 to 2018, you can see the reduction in scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. So I, I don't need to dig into all the details of that, but um, I think graphically it, it gives you a good idea of what we were able to achieve. Um, so what did we learn from all of that? With diligent effort, of course, it's possible to compile your own carbon footprint report. Um, it has several tangible rewards, even in the absence of stakeholder pressure. You have energy cost savings, um, directed energy efficiency interventions. When we decided to supplement um, our energy supply network with a solar panel grid in, in one particular zone of the operation, we knew exactly what we were doing. And, and it we were able to, to, to scope and cost that and understand the saving um, that it would bring in the long term for us. And it's also served for us as a basis for querying municipal energy bills. Um, and at the time, finally, when, when the legislation and the regulations caught up with the need to report, um, we were in a very well prepared to, to adapt and to engage the regulators and the authorities and to comply when, when, when the regulations did come around. Um, so in terms of lessons for small business, I would highly advise try to do your carbon footprint or any other aspect of ESG reporting yourself at least once. But try and do it yourself. It will improve your understanding of your environmental impact and your energy use. And it'll teach you where to find data about your organization. Who knows certain things about your organization and why do they know it? Um, as, a, as a very simple example, one of the things we spent many hours doing was trying to calculate the um, emissions from vehicles and the emissions from flights, only to find that, but when you start asking the right questions, someone else already has the data worked out for you. And it's, it's going through those exercises, making you understand that the business better um, that has uh, tangible value in itself. Uh, that exercise may help you run the business more efficiently and it may actually save you money. Other observations, I think there's value in the executive taking an interest in these activities and not farming it out to a consultant merely to comply. It'll understand the business better and make for better de internal decisions. 
And even in the absence of any stakeholder pressure, I believe there's tangible value and, and tangible benefits from doing an exercise like that. Um, so having had success with our carbon footprint, we also started doing the water footprint in 2014 and onward from there. And that was an even more enlightening process and it resulted in even better savings for the organizations. Um, we realized that the water that we were buying was vastly more than we actually needed on site. Um, we detected many water leaks on site through better measurement, which resulted in the direct cost saving. And we were able to take better decisions on alternative uses of water on site to channel stormwater better, to, to try and capture and distribute that better, all within the allowable regulations, of course. Um, uh, use of boreal water on site and the grey water discharges, what we could and couldn't discharge and those sorts of things, and where we could find alternative uses for the water on site. All of these things resulted in in significant savings uh, for the organization. So again, the, the point is driven home that there's tangible value. It's not just a compliance exercise that needs to cost you money. Um, so in closing, from my side, um, for small companies without resources to invest heavily in a whole suite of ESG reports, I would suggest pick one aspect of the SDGs and start there. Choose the one that you have the most information for and evaluate how that changes your understanding of the business. And, and I would also recommend investing in it personally. Don't contract it out at first, at least. Um, the tools and processes that you'll go through have their own intrinsic value for improved business understanding and providing information to optimize your business's use. And, and that may save you money. Um, and the value of this effort for stakeholders, investors, and other entities is very well established. So with that, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, and for the moment, that's uh, all from my side. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Herman. And um, yeah, certainly great to hear um, a few insights in terms of, of the, the value that can be realized um, from these processes as well, because I think we often focus on, on the cost. Um, I think um, Raylene has managed to join, but but just to give her a bit of time to to land, um, Peter, if if we can go to you next and 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 hear your perspective, and then we'll 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 close off with Raylene before we go to the questions. That would be great. Thanks. I'm Peter Williamson, head of environmental force uh, Riti uh, Cal, and I've been involved in the most recent ESG report for the company that we started to do last year. Prior to that, uh, I also worked for other companies where we did ESG reporting, and there's a number of learnings that I would actually like to, to share from a practical point of view, and I, and, and I think it will complement quite nicely what Zach shared with us, as well as Herman. Uh, and I'm only going to show you this one single slide, because everything I, uh, I need to discuss, uh, I try to capture only on one slide. And uh, the, the, the way I would like to approach it is when you do ESG reporting, uh, one of the most important things you need to start with is to determine what's the boundaries of your report. Uh, how wide are you going to, to make that report uh, uh, a stretch? And, and for me, there was a few boundaries that, that we determined. The, the first one is what's your company values and your sheep policy? That's one definite boundary. And then market expectations. And I think Raylene will uh, probably afterwards speak a bit about what market expectations will be, what shareholders would like to see. Then legislation, uh, the, the legislation of the, of the country in which you operate is quite important. Uh, and, the, and the last one is then what can you physically deliver? Uh, and I think I'll start from the last point, what can you physically deliver? Uh, I think sometimes companies have, uh, have very noble intentions and they might state that uh, they will ensure that all their clients reduce their carbon footprint with 5%, uh, but it's probably just not possible to do it because you are a service provider and, uh, and you don't really have control over what your client can do. However, you can state that your own service providers 
uh, for continuation of business need to reduce their carbon footprint with 5%. So that's why I say it's quite important to know your boundaries and to understand what can you influence and which areas you can't influence. Now, if we look at the left-hand column, uh, the, the, the one in, in white grey, uh, I've listed a couple of points there that I quickly want to speak through. Uh, one of the most important things when you start with your ESG report is to understand your own operation. Uh, what I mean by that is you need to know what is your operational risks in terms of environmental, health, safety, uh, and so forth. If you know those risks, then you will obviously know where your efforts need to go in to bring those risks down. Uh, it's also important to have full alignment from your exco. Uh, if your exco don't understand the, the company's risks, they might perceive that one specific item is a big risk to the company, uh, and they force you to put effort into those risks and into those items, uh, but you don't really... Uh, make a big contribution to the environment and to the ESG space. Uh, and what I found with, with uh, the EXCO, it's a continuous edu uh, education with them uh, because they might attend forums, they might attend workshops where they hear certain buzzwords and they want you to implement it in your company, they want you to take it into consideration. And it's just not possible. To give you a classical example, uh, your, your exco might say that as a company where you have underground mining operations, you must now start to look at uh, carbon capture and storage in your underground workings, but you're still actively mining there. So there's a massive safety risk. It's just not feasible. It's just not possible. Uh, they will then actually in a public space make certain promises that you as a company cannot keep. And therefore, it's quite important to maintain that full alignment with your exco and make sure that they understand the promises that they make and they understand the company risks uh, before they make any of those promises. Then it's also important to understand the public perception of the local community around your operation. If your ESG report do not speak to that public perception or what they understand to be the risks or the impacts on them, you might lose credibility if you don't take that into consideration and speak to those specific items as well that they feel is a risk to the environment, to the immediate environment where they uh, uh, coexist with you where you do your operations. Then in terms of budget availability, moving to the, to the centre column, uh, it's also good and well if certain promises is made in the ESG report in terms of what the company will do to manage risks. But if the company do not make budget available for it, uh, your follow-up ESG reports will be a big disappointment. You will not be able to show money spent to address certain issues. Uh, you will not be able to show progress in terms of uh, your ESG reporting and you lose credibility. So it's quite important, again, full alignment with EXCO in terms of what the company wants to achieve and then for them to make the budget available. Uh, we already speak about uh, don't make promises that you cannot keep. Uh, and then one of the uh, important items is uh, look around you, look at what your competitors are doing. Look at their ESG reports. Uh, what, what promises do they make? What efforts do they put in? For instance, to reduce their carbon footprint, uh, to manage water, uh, those kind of things. So there's a lot to be learned from your competitors. And there's also no shame in talking to your competitors. Uh, I'd like to rather in the mining fraternity call them your colleagues, uh, because uh, it should be a combined effort. Uh, in the mining industry between mine houses in terms of how we, we tackle a lot of these risks. Most of the risks we experience in the mining fraternity is common risks across all operations and all companies. And by combined effort, we can actually uh, make a huge difference if we, if we all start to get the same focus on some of the, some of the common risks. From a practical point of view, uh, especially if you're a smaller company, how do you make sure that uh, you do have some tangible items that you can include into your ESG report without putting too much additional effort into it? 
Uh, and one of the biggest learnings that we learned very quickly was everything you do, you need to capture. Uh, if you capture it properly, and if you have certificates, if you have data, then you can report on it in your ESG space, either with regards to uh, job creation, with regards to carbon footprint reduction. Uh, make sure you capture everything, and in some other way, you will be able to report on that as a positive in your ESG report. Something important to also remember, everything you do, uh, probably have a carbon footprint. You just need to figure out how to convert what you do into a, a, into a carbon unit. If you use electricity, if you burn diesel, if you have waste disposal, if you do waste recycling, all of it have a carbon footprint, just figure out how to convert that into a carbon unit and you can start to declare savings. Uh, then also, uh, biggest bang for your buck, uh, again, if you understand your risks and you understand your biggest risks, uh, obviously you, you you want to make most budget available for that. Uh, and it comes back to the previous point as well. If you capture everything that you spend money on, uh, you should find a way to declare it in your ESG report and, and get some positive spin-offs from it. Then the last one is something that we often do within our own space as we do ESG reporting. It's sometimes good to leave a little bit of space for improvement. If you have a specific trial or specific project, uh, it's good to explain the project. Uh, and if you have some preliminary results, uh, it might be best to, to leave those pre preliminary results to mature into complete results to share within the next year's ESG report. Uh, the, the timing is quite important. If you have a project, uh, don't try and cram everything into one ESG report. Leave something on that specific project that you do uh, to continue over into the next ESG report. However, it is important to make people aware that you are busy with such a project. Uh, and from a practical point of view, these are some of the points I just wanted to share with you. Uh, Clemence, I didn't watch the time, but uh, I hope I didn't went too much over the time. And this is what I would like to share with the forum uh, uh, in today's session. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Peter. That was that was really great. And I think some of these practical points around aligning really the internal realities with the, the external expectations was, was really great. Um, so I think um, before we go to some of the questions, it would be great for Eileen, I think, has joined us and she'll um, just share some thoughts um, going back to, to the external um, lens and, and the investor expectations specifically um, and, and how to address those. So Eileen, I'm going to hand over to you um, and hopefully you, you'll be able to, to share some thoughts around this. Okay, so as mentioned, my main focus is looking from the outside in. So what are key investors want to know about ESG and why are they focusing on this specifically? This will really pro probably provide some insight as to why they ask specific questions. And if you're on the outside, such as a subcontractor or a service provider to a company, this might also provide insight as to why certain companies are asking for information in a certain format. Um, and why they focus on specific um, inputs when, when they give you um, terms of reference or, or uh, focus areas for, for assessment. So really, what are, they, what are they trying to tick off? What are the key the focus areas? And here we're talking about people who invest money. So possibly a, a financial investor, someone who may, may provide debt funding, such as a, a bank, for example. Um, they may even you may also include in here your regulators um, into the basket, but really these are the people who are really evaluating the company and assessing whether or not um, there's value there and and whether or not they actually are managing their risk and overall opportunity uh, creation within the business correctly. So what are they really looking for? For the first is really risk management. So this comes in various forms, but they'll probably ask you specific focus areas around. Um, have you identified key risks? Are there policies in place? Do you have management systems that um, allow you to manage these risks? Have you set objectives? Are there set KPIs that you've uh, identified where you can track um, improvement measures? 
So the next key focus area is measurable. How do you track this information? Is it stored correctly? Um, who actually takes responsibility for this? Is there a specific de dedicated resource or area within the business that manages this risk. And that all provides insight into the external, to the external party as to whether or not you've actually thought through this process, you understand the risks, and you've really set objectives for yourself. Because if you're not measuring them, you probably haven't properly quantified them, which goes back to the risk management aspect, which means you probably haven't assigned the correct resources, you don't, we haven't really defined the the objectives with respect to ESG management and you don't have a system in place which allows you to continue to manage this. Then they will ask you specific questions around materiality determination. So there may be a whole suite of ESG issues which touch on the business itself. But what is physically material to the business? And when we look at materiality, what's important is what helps the business create value. So the, the, the purpose of value creation is really important when it comes to ESG, because you can spend a lot of time, as some of the other um, speakers have mentioned, collecting data, processing data, reporting data, but it has no impact in, on the business itself. So when we talk about materiality is how is it specifically important to an, uh, a strategic stakeholder within the business? So a stakeholder would include, for example, internally your employees or shareholders. Externally, this might be a regulator, your customer base, um, and so on. The second issue is really how is this linked to ongoing viability or value creation within the business? So viability would be linked to things like turnover, profitability, uh, production efficiency. Um, when it comes to viability of the businesses, have you actually looked at changing legislation, regulatory frameworks? Is there, are there any new risks like political risks? Um, climate change may be a specific risk that's linked to your business. And all of these would then determine whether or not what you're focusing on from an ESG perspective is actually material to your business. So when an external investor or stakeholder comes and asks you about materiality, what they're really trying to find out is, have you thought through the process? You haven't just taken a list off the internet. You haven't just listed everything that anybody has asked you. You physically have strategically aligned the ESG criteria to the core processes within your business and you understand ESG. So the next component really is stakeholder identification. <clears throat> so this links strongly to how you communicate what you do around ESG. This has also been mentioned by a lot of the previous um, speakers, but in essence, what's focused here is once you've actually identified the risks, you've started to measure them, you've determined what's material to the business, who do you need to communicate this to? So in order to understand who to communicate this to, and this may be internally to drive efficiencies, so your employees, maybe your supply chain, um, or it could be externally to, for example, the regulator. How do you communicate this? How have you identified this? Is this just the person who, who talk, who's the loudest, who just talks to you and asks you questions all the time? Or is it other smaller uh, stakeholders who actually will drive efficiency within the business, but don't necessarily ask the questions? So what's very important when an investor asks you, have you done stakeholder identification? Do you know who's material to your business? This is important really for, for them to understand how do you drive value within the business? How do you protect your reputation as a business, et cetera? So a lot of the questions may vary. They may come from very diverse different sources, but generally speaking, they fit into one of these four baskets. And it's always important when people are asking you for information or setting a specific terms of reference is trying to identify where this is sitting within these four frameworks. And this will really drive internal performance. So if you're given a specific question around, um, please, can you go and determine a, um, you know, do, an, do a survey around the, the geology in the area or hydrological assessments, et cetera, probably they're trying to assess risk. 
And that really sits around risk management. And finally, when you present that information, you need to understand exactly how you present it so they can incorporate it into their business processes, define that risk, de determine the measures that they're going to use to manage that risk, see, identify exactly where it's material to the business processes in managing that risk, and then how they would communicate it. So really limiting yourself to, re to just articulating the terms of reference itself may not be enough for them to actually translate that into something that's beneficial to the business. And adding that additional layer of interpretation and recommendations can assist the business owner in really implementing or, or presenting the information in a way that they could use it throughout the business, not just for the primary service that you would originally envisage it for, namely identify the reserve or go and go and do a hydrological assessment. So this is really key if you're wanting to understand how to um, benefit the business in the long term. So really to just summarize these desired objectives or outcomes of these external um, stakeholders, they're really focusing on corporate reputation. So what does that mean? In essence, they want to enhance your customer and investor acquisition potential. So if you manage all these aspects mentioned, uh, um, mentioned to the left, in essence, what you are doing is you have a more sustainable business, you're identifying opportunities for growth, you can actually, by doing so, enhance customer uh, your customer base, that draws on and grows your customer base and your revenue and profitability as a business. This, in essence, allows you to um, draw in new investors, acquire new investors into the business, which would further enhance growth and reputation of the business in the long term. Risk reduction is really key to most investors. And this really focuses on key disruptions or losses within the business. So when we're looking at, at uh, risk reduction, they want to ensure that you have a long term, your business is, is sustainable in the long term. So things like climate change risk, very key. We want to understand, have you assessed whether or not you're going to have stranded assets in the, in the pipeline? Have you considered, um, you know, what the impact of climate change and the increase in, temp uh, you know, um, 1.5 degrees to the climate is going to have on your business? Does this affect your supply chain? Um, other risk factors would possibly be things like access to, um, to employee base, you know, um, are you actually managing your attrition rate within the business? Um, your resource efficiency, how you're able to actually access those resources in the long term. All of this brings to bear how you actually manage any key disruptions in the long term, medium to long term within the business to ensure you are viable um, in the long term. Bear in mind, an investor is putting their money into your business. They want to make sure they get a, a return in the, in the long run. Opportunity management. So when you actually are managing ESG, it's not just around the diet side risk mitigation. You're also able to maximize opportunities within the business. So you'll see opportunities to leverage ESG, for example, to enhance efficiencies, um, innovate new products, um, you know, reorganize the business so that it's more resilient and more receptive and can respond quick, quickly to, to disruptions in the market. Um, you increase your productivity, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this is really around leveraging the data you're collecting around ESG. You're managing the risk, yes, you're measuring these, but you also are going to start seeing opportunities to leverage this data to enhance your efficiency. And this is really opportunity management. Again, investor is really key, uh, really, this is really important for them because they want to earn more money ultimately. So if they're investing in your business, they want your business to grow. They want to actually um, earn additional dividends, enhance their, their, their hold, the, the, the value of the business in the long term. So that if they do exit and sell their shares um, to someone else, they've made money, but they've also left um, a business that's stronger, more vibrant, um, and more resilient in the long term. And lastly, what's really important around ESG management in the long term is culture and intrinsic value. So if you have the right culture and people understand the value of ESG, they can actually leverage ESG in the business. What happens is you, you generally start seeing a shift in the way 
things are managed within the business, the culture of the business changes. And this allows you to identify new markets, new customers, new products, new services, and new revenue streams automatically. It becomes part of the way you do business. And ultimately, ESG touches on everything within the business. And by incorporating ESG throughout the process from risk mitigation and management, measure, make, ensuring that they're measurable, they set sit within people's individual KPIs, people understand the value of it, so they've determined the materiality, how it builds value within the business, and you start communicating internally to your, to your staff, to management, externally to key stakeholders, this may include your supply chain, your investors, um, ex your regulators, et cetera. This starts to change the way you approach ESG and it starts to see ESG as a value creation tool as opposed to just an add-on, which often does happen within a business. That is the end of my presentation. Um, so I'm open to questions. I think we're at the end of our presentation session. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks, Verlina. And I think it's such a great um, way to conclude. Certainly, I think um, through these presentations, we've, we've highlighted the importance of, of managing ESG to mitigate um, risks. But I think it's, it's, a really, I think it's, it's a really great way to conclude to consider how ESG can become a differentiator. Uh, and, and certainly some of the trends that we're seeing in the market indicate that ESG will become a differentiator and there's a great opportunity for the mining sector to really integrate ESG in a way that will ensure that as we um, provide the, the, the commodities that are needed for some of the, the transitions that we see coming in the future years, we also um, extend um, the contributions that we can make to, to society um, through really strong ESG management. So I think we have about five minutes left um, and I would really love to provide some time for any questions that might um, have arisen from, from the floor. Um, so I don't know if there's any questions. I haven't seen any in, in the chat, um, but if anyone does have any questions um, that you'd like to ask the speakers or, or just consider on ESG, that would be great. You've got your hand up. <laughs> so maybe um, share a, a final thought. And, and I think Peter fell off, but I think he's trying to rejoin. So. I'm sure you'll come on soon. Okay. Thanks, Clement. Sorry, I, I do need to drop off now. But um, it, just one one thought on uh, something that Hammond said, which I thought was enormously powerful about companies doing this for themselves uh, as a first pass. I think that's incredibly important to be able to see their own risk. And and Peter touched on it as well, which is when we're when we do it ourselves and are able to look at it ourselves we're able to better understand and translate and describe the risk involved the one uh flip i would give to that is i think i think it's important not to focus on a single issue I and mean, that was one of your you know said pick an sdg and focus on that and i think even if you just use the sdgs i like the sdgs i think they're a good meta framework but if if you just use them at a very uh conceptual level even, it gives you a view across your landscape of risk. I think if we focus in too much, uh, we do tend to miss that. And I thought that Peter then raised us with, you know, we've got to have this broad view to understand what our biggest risks are. So uh, that, that would that would just be my only, my only comment there. I think it's important to look across the whole landscape to really be able to pick out which one's the most important for us. Um, if I may, Zach, thank you very much for that. And I mean, you brought a brilliant insight um, to the discussion by, by making us aware that, I mean, the SDGs, like you say, provides the landscape, this picture that, that you should be looking at and evaluating. I think it's enormously valuable. Um, maybe just the, the, the context for me was about the focus on small companies. I, and, and, and I mean, it, it could become overwhelming to try and start looking at this entire breadth of ESG reporting. Yes, there should be awareness of this forest of guidance and, and forest of um, a plethora of, you know, very serious issues on, on a global scale that you should be looking at and considering. Um, uh, and, and I think my, my intention was to maybe just provide smaller companies with an entry point to that. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's 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 those are perfectly valid points. I think it, it could become a bit overwhelming, and if you have 
in like in our experience one or two aspects that you start looking at and saying well how do we build from there it, it, it not only delivers value but it helps you to build those relationships and understand the information that you need to start putting together you know a, a more comprehensive esg uh, um, uh, reporting scope thanks Herman. And, and certainly i think um you know, the importance of using this process to educate, um, you know, your stakeholders, both internally and externally around the, the role and having playing always that lens between the, the, the really broad view and, and, and the, the narrower um, company view is, is going to be very important. Raylene, I, I think you've got your hand up. So if you want to add uh, a few thoughts on, on, on that. Sure. Um, I'm just thought I'd add on if we not, don't have any questions, it might be useful. One thing I often get as a, as a question specifically from clients, and even investors need this clarification, is partitioning what we, what we talk about in ESG into two compartments. There's ESG and there's impact. So um, specifically around ESG, when people are using that terminology, and even the word sustainability is now being thrown together with ESG, that really focuses on what we call risk mitigation. So when people are focusing on those, that terminology and asking about what they're trying to get you to do is talk about the first two quadrants. So have you managed your risk? Are you measuring this risk? When they talk about mid, uh, impact specifically, that is around the value that you've created within the business or in society. And this is where you would start using things like the SDGs. You start using um, other metrics to start looking at um, things like efficiencies in the business, production uh, efficiencies is one area. This may link to things like energy reduction, water reduction use, or even efficiencies within your, your uh, employee base by training and developing. And then there's the impact to society, which is really how you measure with what the SDGs are focusing on, is how you actually leave a legacy or, or um, provide input to things like reduction in poverty. Um, you know, economic stimulus, job creation. So always remember when, when reporting on these things is trying to wear those two hats, what information sits under the ESG basket and what information sits under the impact basket. And the reason why I say that is because you use different tools to measure yourself in each one. And it can become very confusing when you try and mix them together, because then you, you, you kind of forget which ones to use and which tools to use for what. So that would just be a guide or a recommendation that I give you. You don't have to do it that way, but I think it, it helps a lot of clients when I explain that to them to really basket things and get moving and you know achieving the objectives quicker if they understand the difference between the two. Thanks. Uh, Clements? If we could start wrapping it up now. Sure. So I think um, I haven't seen any other questions from the floor. So I, I think I just want to thank very much um, everyone that shared um, their views. Certainly, this is a very dynamic um, area. And I think we've we've heard quite a few practical tips. So I just really want to thank um, Zach, Raylene, Herman, and, and Peter for their contributions and, and um, look forward to the further discussions today around, around this topic. Thanks very much, Clements, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, we're going to move on now to the next session. It's a longer session. It's an hour and a half. So it's over to you, Tim. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks very much, uh, Fiona. Uh, I've, I've got my camera on, but for some reason it, it looks like some kind of uh, video from the 18th century. Uh, so I might switch it off just now once you realise uh, I'm also not a robot. So I'll just leave it on for the first couple of slides. But uh, yeah, we, we've got a, a 90 minute slot here. And uh, we as a panel were very keen that we certainly had opportunity for the 140 people participants uh, uh, in, in this virtual conference to uh, actually voice their opinion and get involved. Uh, so I just want to say that given the diverse array of presentations we've had so far, 
I do believe this particular panel session uh, is actually critically important to, to give an opportunity to, to canvas opinion from the broader uh, range of participants in the conference. And if this panel session can in some, in some way indicate how we steer the way forward with ESG and its integration with resource and reserve reporting, uh, I think it would be a great first stepping stone uh, for how the, the industry approaches that. So uh, let's go to the next slide, uh, Charlene. I'll take my camera off for now. Uh, I'd just like to introduce the panel uh, and the set of slides that we're gonna run through uh, to set the scene and the context uh, or a consolidation of inputs from uh, the entire panel. So it's myself uh, uh, moderating the session uh, and you can see my uh, sort of uh, 35 years industry experience there. Um, We've got Shepard uh, Kozvitsi uh, from African Rainbow Minerals, uh, John Murphy uh, from Mineral Corporation, Yako Boshoff, uh, who's also the lead CP for, for Harmony, uh, and Charlene Wrigley, who works uh, with myself uh, in Goldfields uh, as the Group Sustainable Development Manager. Uh, and I think what's really important about the makeup of this panel is that uh, the, uh, the five of us are, are very, firmly rooted in the critical space in the value chain that's at the interface where mineral companies actually report into the public domain. So uh, a number of us, uh, I think myself, Shepard and Yako in particular, are company lead competent persons. So if you report uh, at the end of this year, for example, through the SEC under the new SK reporting rules as a New York Stock Exchange uh, member, uh, the lead competent person has a significantly elevated accountability uh, and liability when it comes to the integration of ESG information into the normal technical reporting. Uh, so it's particularly important from that perspective. Uh, if we just go to the next slide, Charlene, thanks. So what we'd like to cover uh, initially before we open the floor to discuss what I, what I hope we'll see as uh, uh, the hot topics, is uh, the survey results. Uh, obviously, Tanya and the team sent out a, a pre-conference survey, and we'd like to give you some feedback on the top themes and issues flowing through from that. Uh, I'll cover off on what some of the, uh, the current industry trends are and the, key, and the key drivers behind ESG content in technical reporting. Uh, we'll briefly touch on uh, what we believe are some of the key pitfalls to be avoided. Uh, and then to help trigger discussion, uh, we've got two slides that capture what we believe are the elephants in the room uh, on this particular topic. Uh, and I've got what we call a parking lot. Uh, and if there are particular topics or, or themes or qu queries that crop up during the panel session, we'll put them in the parking lot uh, if, if they need uh, further follow up uh, and discussion outside of this particular conference. Uh, so that's overall what we want to cover in the next uh, hour and a quarter or so. Thanks, Charlene. So I, I've just done this. Uh, we've done quite a lot of industry scanning and, and talking to people. And obviously, we're aware of the, uh, the survey results. And I just wanted to uh, drop a couple of uh, comment balloons down on this slide just to see uh, show you what people are thinking. Uh, so, for example, the top left-hand corner, ESG disclosure is, is quickly becoming a discriminating feature for investors and funders in the industry. So people are making decisions on what stock to buy based on what they're seeing from ESG uh, reporting in mineral companies. On the top right-hand side, we're hearing from a lot of people that uh, understanding, assessing, and communicating the material ESG factors in the correct context is rapidly becoming uh, an essential uh, capability of, of the lead competent person in a mineral company. Uh, the bottom right-hand corner, we need to be aware of the exploding reporting burden. Uh, and I think uh, the people on this, uh, on this conference uh, and potentially involved with future working groups certainly need to have a key focus on managing that reporting burden, uh, that it doesn't become too onerous and continues to add value. Uh, and I think I'll just pick up one more off there is uh, there's clearly a mixture of uh, anxiety, uh, but also enthusiasm about what ESG integration 
in resource and reserve reporting really means. Uh, but anxiety, enthusiasm are the, are the two keys, uh, key themes uh, flowing through there. So there's very much a, a diverse view of what this all means to the industry uh, currently. Thanks, Charlene. Uh, I'm actually going to hand over to Charlene now just to give you a, a high level summary of, of the key themes coming through, fr through uh, from the survey that was held a few weeks ago. Thanks, Charlene. Thank you, Tim. So the panel members and yourself, of course, worked through this. So hello to Shepard, Yaku and John, and thank you, Tim. Um, and we basically put our thoughts together after reviewing the survey outputs to try and get an idea of what the themes or questions, most popular or interesting questions were that came out of the survey. And that's what we've captured on this slide in a box, each box with a different color. So the key themes that came out were the importance of this reporting obligation or the ESG reporting obligation in your mineral reserve and mineral resource reporting and declarations. Now that came through in a few examples, which I think I'll take you through soon after I've covered the top four bullets, but basically we can't escape it. It's expected, it's required, um, different obligations exist in different duplications, but it's here to stay. And there was a very clear message that came out of the survey that engagement and awareness is required. Many of our presenters over the last day and a half have picked up the same comment that additional support, education, awareness, and of course, guidance is required. Um, not everybody fully understands what E, S, and G includes or incorporates. I think that could be addressed further as part of further work in the space, but perhaps more importantly out of the questionnaire, is that G absolutely needs to be considered. There's a lot of maturity in the E and arguably in the S space. G is possibly a little bit less mature in the reporting space, but certainly needs to be included and picked up going forwards. And then you'll see where the hot topic stars are included on the slide um, in the maroon and orange sort of box, that there was definitely division in the respondees' um, response to the question. <laughs> And basically that division was whether or not guidance should be included as part of existing guidance or separate guidance, and whether or not reporting should be included as part of existing reporting or separate reporting. So if you allow me to take you through the different boxes or, or areas of findings that came to these top four conclusions, I'll, I'll provide a bit of color and detail to that. So basically, um, the first one of question two was that um, reports should comply with the SAM ESG guidelines. Um, and the, the reports that were nominated by the respondees was the annual mineral resource, mineral resource and mineral resource reports, the annual sustainability reports, and competent risk reports as and when required by the JSE. I'm sorry, this is. Sorry, Charlie, I'm just going to ask uh, Mr. Michael Hall if he can uh, uh, mute his microphone, please. Thanks. I have muted him already. Thank you. But basically, the message is pretty clear here, with more than half of the responders saying that the reporting obligation is material. It's there and it needs to be included. The forum in which it's included or how it should be picked up, there is obvious debate, and that's also come out in the last day and a half but the obligation is required. And those are, are three very material and important areas in which there is such an expectation. And of course, general alignment, I would say around this. Um, one of the other things that stood out, and this came out quite clearly initially in question three, was SAM ESG. Um, and basically these guidelines do exist. They've been established for a while. Um, but we're not seeing a lot of reference in it, certainly in the reports referenced above as an example. And the reason elected or selected in the survey was around awareness and consultation and disclosure. So, I mean, that makes up seven, more than 75% of the responses in that, in that instance. And that supports one of the concluding bullets right at the top on the left-hand side, and that engagement and awareness is further required. So question 17 came to the G component of E, S, and G. Um, is governance to be included as a modifying factor? And arguably, you could say as part of all your disclosures and reporting. And 60% of the responders say yes. 
but many responders included the option that said clear guidance is required. So I guess you could also say that in this instance, perhaps additional education and awareness could support this disclosure further, but G, G needs to be included, so to speak. Moving on to the right-hand side of the slide, um, into the maroon box, the, this is where we have division amongst the responses. And I think this was worth noting because we, we have a division around something that is arguably mutually exclusive. So we need to get some sort of sense of whether it goes one way or the other because it can't possibly or comfortably go both ways. So the first one was around guidance. Um, should the SAM ESG be fully integrated into existing guidance, SAM or XAMVAL, um, or should it exist as a standalone set of guidance and documents? And there was clear division across the responses that came in in the questionnaire. Um, almost sort of a 42 to 50% swing. So you could roughly say half-half. I know it's not quite, but I think it's significant enough to say that there's a division on where the guidance should sit. Build it in or let it stand alone. And I, I guess there would be arguments to and for both. Um, and then also leading on to that is the actual reporting. You know, guidance can tell you what to include, but when you do pick up the ESG requirements in your reserve and your resource reporting, where does this sit? Um, is it a separate disclosure that, for example, some of your other reporting can reference, or is it integrated into one disclosure? Um, and in this case, you know, specifically around ESG reporting, would it sit, for example, in your mineral reserve and resource disclosure or other? So now I'm very aware that 80% and 75% don't equal 100%. In this instance, responders could choose more than one answer but these were still the majority of the responses or they held the most weight, which is um, where the conclusion came from that there, there seems to be some division on where we actually capture the pertinent ESG inform information in the, the greater reporting suite of documents. And then lastly, this was quite interesting to me as an ESG practitioner, is that um, question 13 sort of tried to to put out there some of the myths that exist around the reporting in the ESG space. And um, quite a, a significant myth that I guess we as industry practitioners in general see out there is that ESG is unrelated to reserve and resource. I think, um, and hopefully this last day and a half has done a lot to help dispel that myth, but it seemed quite interesting to me that a lot of people believe that such a, a myth is very prevalent out there. Um, another one is that ESG comes at the expense of investment performance. That's also quite a, a, pro, a pro present or prominent risk that came out, or myth, apologies, that came out of the survey. Once again, we've had a lot of speakers that have hopefully, you know, created additional awareness or education around the space. Um, and then investors don't walk the talk. It's only for millennials and it's not a South African issue. There was a, a very solid response about around that. Once again, uh, responders could answer more than one option in this question. But I think it seems very clear that with these kind of messages coming out of people believing that these myths are in play, that education and awareness is absolutely required in this space. Um, because per the previous points, this is not optional. You know, the reporting obligation is very real and very material. So Tim, I think that sort of sums it up. I'm sure when we move into the discussion section, people will be happy to raise more questions and answers around that too. That's great. Now, Charlene, thanks very much for that uh, overview of the survey results. And we'll certainly circle back uh, to these hot topics uh, a bit later when we open the floor uh, to further discussion. Thanks, Charlene. We can move on to the next slide. Uh, I, I think uh, to, to help uh, set the scene uh, before we open the floor a bit later for questions or discussion is to just pick up on what some of the current industry trends are. <clears throat> and I, I think this slide reflects a lot of the conversation that's happened uh, over the last day and a half already. Uh, and uh, some of the themes I'll pick up on here are obviously materiality uh, is key, uh, diversity and, and climate. Uh, the tailings management with the new global industry uh, tailings standard, uh, mine closure and rehabilitation 
uh, is a very prominent feature in technical resource and reserve reporting. Uh, and there's a number of other items there, such as uh, actual ESG performance. Uh, now, the landscape is changing dramatically, I think, at the moment. And uh, there's a lot of uh, new stakeholders uh, involved, and it's growing and becoming more multidisciplinary, uh, as we've heard from a lot of previous speakers. Uh, the requirements are, are increasing uh, quite dramatically as regards standards uh, and guidelines and key performance indicators. Uh, and the number of reports, uh, such as climate change reports and reports to society, uh, are increasing as well. Uh, and my, my view is that uh, there's a growing diversification of reporting required, uh, which potentially could actually damage the, the sustainability of ESG reporting. Uh, it should ra rather be driven uh, on a road of convergence and streamlining uh, rather than increasing disaggregation. So I think that will con continue to confuse uh, uh, the market uh, and stakeholders uh, if we let that happen. So we need to be uh, acutely aware of uh, working against disaggregation and more against convergence in reporting in this context. Uh, it, the need is for it to be more integrative, obviously clear and concise uh, and uh, comparable. So I think benchmarking uh, for investors and stakeholders will become increasingly important. And obviously the focus on risk and reputation. Uh, and we've seen earlier, I think from uh, Roger's presentation as well, when it comes to the risk and reputation around uh, heritage and tailings management, uh, it is uh, exponentially growing as well. The, the investor expectations are growing all the time. Uh, particularly with reporting requirements. Uh, and the focus needs to be on uh, streamlining this. Uh, and it, for me, it's very much about uh, assurance uh, to uh, the reader of any, any such public reports. Uh, they need to get uh, a level of satisfaction with the assurance involved with the ESG reporting. Thanks, Charlene. We'll go to the next one. Uh, I think if you stand back from the, 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 the landscape we're looking at here, uh, there's actually a, a push and a pull relationship taking place across the industry, and they're not uh, exclusive of, of each other. But uh, the way we've tried to put it in an infographic here is that there's definitely a pull from uh, investors, potential investors, analysts, and, and various stakeholders uh, with, a, with a huge focus on assurance. Uh, and some of the, the key items there under that pool are, are obviously uh, transparency, consistency, uh, the assurance and verification and the reputation. Uh, but equally, there's a push, uh, as I describe it, from uh, the codes, the regulators, uh, the various uh, exchange listing requirements uh, with a focus on risk management and compliance. Uh, and that's obviously driven by uh, codes, permits, uh potentially penalties and fines and sanctions uh the overall license to operate uh, and particularly the liability uh and and partic particularly post-closure liability uh, and the various standards uh, so the two blue arrows there between the push and the pull boxes uh, is to really demonstrate that they're not exclusive of each other but there is very much a positive tension uh between these two aspects of, of uh, reporting so uh, some of the key themes flowing through from what we've looked at uh, that are on the radar screen uh, and certainly need, need to be looked at, they can't be ignored, is the ESG challenges, particularly in resource and reserve reporting. And this panel session is, <clears throat> I won't repeat it too often, but it is looking at ESG through the lens of mineral resource and mineral reserve reporting. Uh, <clears throat> so and. There has to be a clear understanding of what ESG includes in that specific context. Uh, and I think uh, most people are, are reasonably familiar with the E and the S uh, as described here, uh, but the G is the important factor. And uh, should that become part of the modifying factors and also the uh, reasonable prospects for eventual economic extraction, the RP, triple E criteria uh, that gets looked at through SAMREC. Uh, some of the other items on the, the radar screen uh, is the, the changing ESG reporting expectations 
many of which are overlapping and duplicating already, uh, and some actually have conflicting requirements, uh, which, as I said, is, is not going to actually contribute uh, to a solid sustainability reporting framework at the end of the day if they are conflicting. Materiality is, is increase, increase, increasingly important as well. Uh, and there's a clear desire for practical guidance. Uh, and I know uh, the JORC Australian code uh, in their rewrite and update are certainly looking at uh, embedding ESG in a meaningful manner there. Uh, and of course, we understand that uh, the SAM ESG guideline is also uh, about to be uh, revised and updated as well. Uh, and these are incredibly important uh, practical guidance references for the industry uh, and, and significant effort needs to be put in, into making sure they're, uh, they're configured in the right manner. Uh, and I'll, I'll probably highlight that uh, if there are working groups to be established uh, to help put this together in a meaningful and value-add way to the industry, I think it will be incredibly important that those working groups uh, have the right makeup and representation uh, to provide a full 360 de degree view on the industry and that it's not particularly biased in any particular direction. Uh, and obviously from the competent person perspective, uh, awareness, education and training uh, are, are flagged by most practitioners at the moment and how is that going to be addressed. Uh, and I think finally at the bottom of this slide, and I think this is also a, a key aspect, that when uh, guidance uh, is revised and updated and issued to the industry, uh, and if it's particularly embedded in the, uh, the codes uh, that the various exchanges uh, rely on, we need to ensure a level playing field, that there will always be companies that demonstrate leading practice. Uh, but I, I think the guidance that is provided to the industry certainly needs to set out the minimum requirements in a clear and concise manner. So uh, people, mineral companies can be viewed in an equitable manner. Uh, and I think that's a, a particularly important aspect to get right uh, going forward. Thanks, Charlene. Let's move on to the, the next one. Uh, this slide has, has been put together just to highlight, I think, some of the pitfalls that need to be avoided. Uh, and again, this is through the lens of resource and reserve reporting. Uh, in uh, integrated annual reports or resource and reserve supplements to integrated annual reports. Uh, and it's important to, uh, to get a feel for what is relevant to the business. What do investors, regulators, and stakeholders want or in fact need to know? Uh, and for me, it's about integrating and not duplicating. Uh, and, and what I have seen uh, in the past is it's too easy for companies to do what I call data dumping uh, to address uh, queries and expectations. Uh, and as an industry, we need to be much better than that and actually put focus on what's material uh, and, re and required from a transparency and risk management point of view to provide the assurance people, uh, stakeholder, as stakeholders are looking for. Uh, and the focus should be on, the principle should be on convergence, alignment, and simplicity going forward, as I said, to avoid that disaggregation uh, in the future. Uh, and then a key question for competent persons uh, or lead competent persons for mineral companies, how do they actually satisfy themselves on the ESG content of technical reports? Uh, what sort of training should be in place for the industry? Uh, do technical competent persons rely on the subject matter experts, uh, or do they have to make sure that they're equipped with a, a certain working knowledge of ESG items to be able to sign off as the lead competent persons? And where does that professional accreditation actually reside? We're familiar with uh, the South African Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, the Australian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, uh, SACNASP with the uh, professional scientific uh, accreditation, but exactly where does ESG professional accreditation sit? Uh, and uh, what needs to be done to uh, confirm those ESG practitioners actually achieve that level of accreditation? 
uh, is certainly a question that's hanging out there. Uh, and, and another one is that uh, mineral companies will routinely have their resources and reserves externally audited for independent assurance on some level of, of routine basis, depending on a particular company's uh, protocol. But uh, I, I'm particularly keen to understand how the, the, the consultancy world will approach these audits when they look at ESG content in resource and reserve reporting. Uh, because there's uh, an opportunity for a disconnect to take place here between external auditors and the companies themselves. And I think there needs to be some uh, alliance and conversation uh, uh, around what is mutually expected from uh, independent audits uh, in that context as well. So that's just a, a few of the pitfalls to be avoided. And I think, uh, Charlene, that takes us on to the last two slides. Uh, now I can briefly just scan over these two slides, which uh, we as a panel feel are the elephants in the room. Uh, but uh, I'm cognizant of the fact that this needs to be a, a panel discussion. And we certainly want to give some quality airtime uh, to the 140 people on the call to actually raise what they believe are perhaps the hot topics or the issues that need discussion. So I'm not going to talk through all of these, but uh, you, you can see, uh, based on what we've just covered, uh, the items that we, we believe should be discussed either in, in, in this forum or certainly in future workshops, uh, are, and I'll pick uh, some out of here, uh, what's appropriate and relevant for ESG disclosure in annual resource and reserve reports, uh, how do we integrate uh, guidelines such as SAM ESG with SAMREC? Should they be kept separate? Should they be integrated? Uh, should the JSE listing rules, uh, section 12 that we're familiar with, actually prescribe ESG uh, as manda mandatory items in being able to uh, file on the, uh, the JSE, which is a carrot or the stick type uh, context? Uh, and then should material ESG information support RNR reporting, uh, or should it be cross-referenced uh, from other uh, reporting within a company to avoid duplication? There's a couple of points there, and perhaps the last slide, Charlene, before we uh, open to the floor and ask Yako or, or Shepard for their thoughts. Uh, should governance, I mentioned this earlier, be included in the modifying factors and in the reasonable prospects for eventual economic extraction? Uh, if governance is to be included, uh, the requirements would need to be outlined in, in the guideline. Uh, moving down the list there, how can assurance and competency be assured and the lead comp competent person satisfy him or herself? Uh, and there's a list of uh, sub dot points there. Uh, and then from an ESG subject expert perspective, where is the professional home for ESG experts? Would it be SACNASP, SAIMM, GSSA, or, or something, something else? Uh, and then finally, uh, how do we educate, engage, and leverage awareness uh, across the entire industry on the importance of ESG in, in resource and reserve annual reporting? Uh, so the, the tagline at the bottom of the slide is just saying, uh, a SAM codes working group uh, is probably required to clarify these issues and provide the uh, appropriate document guidance. But uh, having given that scene set, uh, the lay of the land of, of the landscape, uh, I'm quite keen to uh, throw it open to participants. But just before that, I'm going to ask Yako or, or Shepard, if there's anything I've missed or something you'd like to further emphasize, uh, please go ahead and do that just now. Thanks, Tim. Um, it's Yaku. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yep, clearly. Okay, thank you. Yes, we can um, hear you. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, maybe just to, to add a few points uh, to the presentation, Tim. Um, you know, what I picked up from yesterday's discussion also and from, you know, today's sessions is that, um, you know, and Roger also stated it clearly, you know, um, the, the, the ESG portion is becoming increasingly more critical in terms of the modifying factors you know, going forward. 
And um, you know, from looking through our lens, which is the Mineral Reserves and Resources Reporting, you know, I was thinking that you know, there might be a way to actually integrate and cross-reference these things, but it has to be guided by firstly getting the guidelines you know, sorted out, you know, like the same ESG and these sorts of things, and then work from there. You know, for example, in the mineral resource and reserve reports, you know, you've got different projects and different operations and different mines in a different life cycle. So each would require a bit of a different ESG perspective. And, uh, you know, one could develop some sort of a scorecard or balanced scorecard for each, for each and uh, or infographics, you know, I mean, people like to see pictures these days um, i'm just trying to sort of quote some examples that came to mind of how one can actually do these things without uh, overloading the reports and then obviously then cross-reference to the uh, you know the professional suite of esg documents that i mean we for example have in, in harmony uh, because i mean you can't in my view cover all the detail but you have to demonstrate in your mineral reserve and resource reporting um you know, that you do take serious cognizance of the ESG issues and as a company, that's part of your values. And I mean, just the final point uh, for me is, you know, in the mineral resource and reserve reports, it's also an opportunity to actually address perceptions that might exist, you know, um, from an ESG point of view. And then also maybe something that I would like to put to the floor, Tim, um, if I may, you know, is the social media challenge, and is that something that we should consider um, somewhere in our reporting and you know, how to deal with that aspect? Because there's some challenges and opportunities when it comes to social media, especially in the ESG space. Uh, thank you. No, thanks, Jaco. Uh, all very pertinent points, uh, for sure. Thanks for that. Uh, Shepard, uh, would you like to add to that? Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, uh, I think um, it's a number of, uh, of, of, of issues, I think, that we highlighted in the survey that are quite, uh, quite important. And the way, you know, um, the, 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 um, uh, the, the responses uh, were, I mean, indicated that obviously there is uh, quite a lot of, um, you know, different views in terms of how to deal with these ESG uh, matters. And one of the things that I just wanted to highlight is, um, you know, the fact that um, there is quite a lot of, uh, you know, um, reporting also that's being done right now by my mining companies uh, with regards to uh, environmental and social and governance matters. Uh, but uh, for me, it's the, it's the integration, you know, which is quite important. What is relevant in terms of, um, of uh, reporting resources and, 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 and reserves, mineral resources and reserves. And uh, obviously the issue of cross-referencing will be very important. But if obviously there are some uh, material matters that need to be highlighted in those uh, mineral resources and reserve reports, uh, then they get uh, highlighted there as well. So one of the key issues for me is integration. The other one is uh, standardization. You know, um, you know, standardizing. You know, what actually should, uh, as far as resources and reserves are concerned, should be the uh, issues that should be uh, you know reported in terms of uh, uh, ESG parameters, and 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 obviously that goes on to you know. Um, you know, how much do we know of the some ESG? How, you know, have we been applying those guidelines? How do we actually look at it? And is the awareness, you know, to all the competent persons of, uh, of, of these requirements that are out there, environmental and social, you know, are already in some record, um, you know, and, and in the modifying factors as well. Uh, what about governance, you know, and how much of that do we actually take on board and make sure? Uh, it's uh, well referenced and, and 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 referred to in mineral resource and 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 the reserve reports. So you know those are some of the uh, key things you know that I think from my side are quite important to you know uh, to look at. But uh, I think the issue of making sure that we don't overburden ourselves in terms of reporting, because they are all, you know they if you look at company reports today, you do see quite a lot of material as reported on environmental, social, and governance. And and, and, and and just being able to, um, you know, get from that uh, what is actually relevant to mineral resource and reserve reporting. Thank you. No, thanks, uh, Shepard. And uh, David from the Mineral Corporation, uh, would you like to add anything to that? Thank you, Tim. It's, it's John. Good Sorry, day, John. everyone. <laughs> Good day, everyone. And thank you very much for this um, extraordinary, valuable 
encounter on matters of ESG. I guess um, the Mineral Corporation falls into the category of a, an advisor or consultancy that assist companies in the annual resource and reserve audits that Tim mentioned in, in the concise presentation we've run through now. And perhaps in, in that context, we can share a couple of TMC specific observations over the last two decades that we've been doing such assignments for a range of companies. Um, companies of the stature of the listed majors in South Africa, all the way through to junior explorers in Southern Africa and further afield. And it has definitely been a, a tangible trend through our assignments over these last two decades where what was originally a resource or reserve audit that focused on the solely on the technical components of a minerals resource estimate and the reserves on which uh, a feasibility or a mine plan is built. Um, the, the trend has been rapidly accelerating into necessarily including audit opinions on the material ESG components as they may affect modifying factors in the first instance. And secondly, how they may affect company reputation, the uh, community involvement, the social license to operate, all of that is now becoming accessory, but important elements of a resource or reserve audit assignment. Uh, we'd, we'd offer the, the perspective that a constructive, uh, meaningful and valuable resource or reserve audit should amplify and highlight areas for improvement in a, in a particular company's resource and reserve management, estimation and governance. It should also, in a constructive manner, seek to calibrate across particular operations within a group or particular projects within a group, the, the social license, the governance license, the credibility of, of the work being presented. And to that end, in support of this trend over the last two decades, we're seeing that mineral resource audits or reserve audits are necessarily multidisciplinary. So the competent persons leading the, the audit will rely on a range of uh, associates, colleagues in the audit role to seek, test and validate all of these technical and non-technical parameters. It's, it's been an extraordinary trend which has accelerated it's um, a discriminating factor now for many of the leading global companies around the world. And the, the resource and reserve audit role fulfills, if you like, for many companies, a first test of all of the ESG parameters that may end up in the public domain reporting. It's a critical assessment for many companies. And um, it, in some of our audit assignments, it's where we have been instructed to start by some of the more progressive companies that have embraced ESG as a key component of their reporting. I'll close with one, one other comment to, to make, and that relates to the integration of the, the codes and guidelines with the note that um, please do not neglect the junior explorers, the junior mining companies, those companies at, a, at the earlier stages of a, a mineral deposit development um, life cycle where ESG reporting um, necessary and required as it is, may be of quite a different complexion and scale and intensity to uh, major mining companies with established long life assets. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. I'll pause there.
John, thank thank you very much. Uh, yeah, you make you make some good comments there, and uh, if I can just wire into to one of the things you said is uh, I've traditionally had a scope of work for independent auditors when they come into goldfields to do resource and reserve audits, uh, but that scope of work actually includes a, a definitive section on sustainability, and it, it has for a year or two, uh, with a view to actually reporting what, what I've been calling for a while now, a, a sustainable life of mine plan with sustainable reserves. Uh, and that, that's because ESG is, is very much integrated into the, uh, the validation, validation uh, of a goldfields reserve. Uh, and we, we, there's still huge room for improvement and we'll keep getting better at that. Uh, but it's certainly a path uh, we've been following uh, for a year or two uh, now. So uh, I, I think hopefully what we've achieved is to put quite a lot of uh, recipe ingredients down on the table here in the mix uh, to hopefully uh, trigger and en enable uh, some good conversation with the, uh, the conference participants. Uh, and without being prescriptive, I'd like to throw the, uh, the floor open to, to any questions, comments or queries uh, to, uh, that we can kick off with. And uh, the panel will do our, our utmost to uh, assist with any uh, responses. Thanks very much. Um, that, that was a fascinating session. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'd like to pick up on one of the very last points that, that John just raised. Uh, Sam ESG was groundbreaking for those of us who have been involved in ESG reporting and mineral and resource uh, statements for, in my case, um, 15 odd years. Um, and that is the, the, the last thing he said about the differential between the different levels of reporting. I really think that one of the things that needs to be teased out in any review of the guideline is the need to differentiate between what the ESG explore, uh, expectations are for an exploration project, a, a mineral resource project, and a mineral reserve project. Uh, you know, mineral reserves actually are the easiest. Chances are there's feasibility studies, there's all sorts of ESIAs, there's all sorts of documents that you can rely on, but that's a lot harder at the exploration and, and resources stage. Uh, so, so I think the expectations around that need to be teased out. The, the other thing is differentiating between greenfields reporting and operational sites, uh, basically the same reason operational sites have a lot more data and greenfields often have a lot less. And guidance on how to deal with that, I think would be hugely beneficial for those people who are having to apply uh, ESG reporting in resource reserve statements. Thank you. Yeah, Fiona, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for the question. And, and just before I actually give uh, John uh, an opportunity to comment as well, I'd like to say that you, you've hit on a, uh, quite a, a personal hot topic for me there, Fiona, uh, because if if we think globally, uh, and I'll, I'll reference the new SK thirteen hundred reporting uh, that's being uh, that you have to meet uh, to be uh, an SEC uh, registrant, they've obviously put out a, a guideline uh, that's some four hundred pages long, and I think it's got some hundred and four prescriptive requirements in our technical reporting embedded in it. But they, they've had to, the SEC have had to do a catch-all guideline which covers IPO offerings, exploration projects, operations that have been going for 20 years, that have a 30-year life, et cetera. And, and at the end of the day, you do get caught between a rock and a hard place when you try and have a catch-all solution. So the point you're making, Fiona, I think is, is very, very pertinent, that there are different approaches needed whether it's a, an initial public offering, an exploration project, or something much more advanced or a long life operating mine, I think the requirements are and should be quite different. And I do agree with you, that needs to be picked up in future guidance. Uh, so I think that's a great point, but I'm actually gonna also give uh, John the opportunity to comment if that's okay. Spot on Tim, Fiona, thank you for that marvelous question. Um, 
I think uh, the the front end of the business, the greenfields exploration resonates with all of us in the Southern African context. Many of us had the privilege of growing up in, in companies uh, where exploration in a Southern African context was front and center. Um, while the, the discrimination between project life cycle and um, obligations or requirements or recommendations for ESG reporting is clear. It's, it's remarkable, I think, in, in all of our collective histories. We, we will all recall those um, exploration projects run by particular companies or organizations which got it right, doing the simplest things. And um, in my view, and I speak from a, a career history that's been um, exploration geology before consulting and advising, um, I have a sense that if you start an exploration project with authentic ESG matters front and center, it's probably the best way to start engaging communities, landowners, stakeholders in the district, and, and the authorities under which that exploration is being regulated. It, it may be low-hanging fruit to establish a credible, authentic ESG approach for, for an organization in a community um, where initial skepticism is neutralized by authentic action. It may be a very much harder for established operations to perhaps claw back or improve existing district perceptions of, of prior wrong, whether the perceptions are based on fact or not. So I, I think this, this avenue in the debate could actually identify some, some key levers that companies across the project and mining spectrum may choose to, may choose to amplify. Thank you. Yeah, uh, th thanks very much, John. And, and, and I think uh, a very good litmus test of, of this, uh, Fiona, is that uh, I think 10 years ago, uh, many companies, uh, risk registers that got presented to their board of directors were focused on uh, mining costs and volumes and, and head grades and processing throughput. Whereas today, uh, I can assure you, in the top 10 risk registers going to companies' boards, there'll be a significant contribution from communities uh, permitting uh, uh, stakeholder management, et cetera, uh, and particularly uh, environmental and social. So it, it's very much uh, uh, a turning in the tide, uh, I, I think we've seen. Uh, it's a good way of reflecting that. I'm keen to uh, thank. Thanks very much for that, and I've recorded that as a as a key point uh, for follow up. Uh, I'd like to go to Sif, who's next in in the list for a question. Uh, please go ahead, Sif. Hi, Tim. Uh, yeah, well done on the discussion. I think it it's the right nose throughout, and I can't can't agree more that there's significant need for minimum guidance and a working group. Just want to highlight the issue regarding current ESG sustainability reports. So the buzzword that everyone wants to say is that one must cross a reference. Now I've got two little issues just to highlight. The one I've yet to come across the ESG report that actually discuss or describes the life of mine profile of an operation or the mineral reserves, mostly they refer to historic or current ESG risk management processes. And, and secondly, uh, ESG report in terms of cross-referencing, uh, typically ESG report talks about managed operations. And uh, there are many examples where mineral reserves and resources talk about uh, not only managed, uh, but also material uh, where there's a joint venture or some relationship to another company. In any case, well done like the discussion. No, great, thanks very much for that. Uh, I just want to check in with, uh, also with Shepard and, and Yako at this stage. Uh, any any comments uh, on the, the conversation so far? Yeah, I mean, a key point is obviously, and I support that, I mean, greenfields exploration versus projects versus current operations. And then the other critical one is, um, you know, the closure of operations. I think we must also just um, 
you know, operation that's, that's at, the, at the end of the life cycle, busy closing. I mean, how do you report on that? Just as a point. Thank you. Um, thank, thanks, Jaco. Shepard? Just a comment from myself as well. I think uh, the point that CF is quite important, you know, on the, um, you know, on this cross referencing, the fact that, um, you know, you need to make sure that, um, you know, the information that's contained in the, you know, resource and reserve reports, you know, talks to the, you know, whatever is reported elsewhere in the, in, you know, in, in the, uh, you know, ESG uh, uh, section. I think that's, uh, that, 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 that's very important. Unfortunately, as well, if they're JV, um, you know, um, JVs that are there, sometimes that detail is not available. And I think it's some of those things that need to be looked at so that, um, um, you, 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 the required information that uh, you know um, has to be reported in minerals and in reserves on ESG is available. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that, Shepard. Uh, I see uh, Kevin Davis. Uh, your hand is up. Kevin, please go ahead. Hi, hi Tim. Um, so, for those of you that don't know, I mean, a lot of you don't. Uh, I sit on Sam Esk and I concentrate on the G, not the E and the S, because as you heard from yesterday, I'm an accountant. So, one of the things that I'm wondering whether it's potentially possible is we have an opportunity to rethink the reconciliation annual reconciliation process and for corporates to actually identify where they have taken reserves and resources out of the recon because of enhanced E and S issues or even brought it back um, as a consequence of E and S because I think so, I think we need to find a way to get a better cross-pollination between the annual reconciliation and the information that the company puts out elsewhere. You know, I see in a lot of reports, companies say, well, we haven't achieved um, our forecasts and our um, cash flows because of poor grade. Okay, so is that, that, is that a reflection on the operator in that there's poor grade control or God forbid they're off plan of mining resources or is it a reflection on the geologist? is that the, the grades are bad, and therefore do I have a poor perception of the cupboard of what the reserve and resource report is? And I think we need to find a way to get the two together and use this um, to achieve a better um, reporting. I say, I concentrate on the G because that's what worries me, um, but I see that we get different information flows across the, across the entire spectrum of the reports, and they're not consistent, and that would create doubt for the investor. No, no, thanks, Kevin. And uh, I'm actually going to ask uh, just now uh, Charlene if, if she's perhaps got a comment on that. But uh, I, th I think the point is well made. Uh, and I think uh, a theme running through, uh, through the industry, uh, or, or certainly from the stakeholders that are going to be reading these reports, is that how do we get the level of consistency right that some objective benchmarking can be done uh, so people can have a view on uh, a mineral company demonstrating leading practice in the ESG space, whereas perhaps uh, another company taking more of the, uh, the tick the box approach and not walking the talk, uh, as we heard highlighted yesterday. So I think when the, the guidelines, the updated ESG guideline or whichever guys uh, it, it, it take it morphs into going forward, I think does have to set the minimum standards so that, uh, that, that there's an opportunity to, to look at companies in an equitable manner, definitely. Uh, Charlene, would, would you like to comment on uh, the, the last uh, point made? Thank you, Tim, and thank you, Kevin. Um, and I certainly, I think that sounds like a great idea. I agree with you. Let's... Um, let's recalibrate or, or reconcile against perhaps what could be considered to be key ESG indicators, in your case, the G, or um, other modifying factors. Um, and and I, think, I think ultimately that's where we want to be. I do think that the proof will be in the pudding and it's quite a mature position and it would probably take a while to get there. Um, and I think there's that we, we'd face in that journey are around um, you know, who does this, who gets involved. Uh, already in the chat, there's comments coming up about the competent person. Is it one competent person? Is it a range of people? What are their qualifications? 
how do they go backwards and forwards in this space? And I suppose that also speaks about integrating, you know, truly integrating into the way in which we reconcile or even determine our, let's say, resources to begin with. Um, I also think that you'd probably need to pick out the material elements in order to do that reconciliation. Um, and I guess there you'd probably want some guidance around that or, um, I don't know, some sort of standardization, although in every instance it would be different. So it's a tough one, but you wouldn't want people to avoid key issues when they really could influence your reconciliation. Um, and so that materiality question and relevance question, I think, would also be a challenge to, to dictate in the gardens. But, but I really think it's, it's ultimately a, a real test of where you stand and where your declaration stands. So I, I'd certainly welcome that. Yeah, thanks, Charlene. And, and thanks, Kevin. I think that's a, a really good point made as well. Uh, and one I've put in the, uh, the parking lot that's definitely going to have to get dealt with uh, going forward. Is uh, Tanya, is that your hand up there? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, go, please go ahead, Tanya. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. A couple of people have mentioned the idea of a working group to try and work through some of the issues. Do you envisage this working group as being within SAMREC, SAMESC, or a combination of the two? Uh, is that potentially a question to myself, Tanya? Uh, Yes, and to, to, to the whole core panel, actually. I'll kick off and, and just say that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge supporter of convergence uh, and aggregation uh, as opposed to divergence and disaggregation. So uh, as a practitioner for, for almost two decades of, of uh, competent person reporting into a, a multitude of jurisdictions, my preference would be for it to be embedded uh, in a, an expanded SAMREC code. So there was one point of reference and, and that way you'd ensure it was fully integrated into the financial and technical aspects as well. So it would be a SAMREC code that had technical, non-technical and financial all embedded in there, including ESG. Now, how practical or easy it would be to do it that way is, a, is another question. But if I have had a magic wand, that would, that would be my first preference. Uh, so uh, that, that's my view. But I'll, uh, I'll, I'll kick off and, and just hand over to John, perhaps for, for the next comment. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I'd make the, the suggestion that um, the formulation of a revised SAMES code should certainly be a collaborative uh, series of interconnected conversations between the SAMVAL committee, the SAMRIC committee, and the SAM ESG committee. Practically speaking, um, the prospect of consolidating all of this into a, a rewrite of the SAMRIC code feels incredibly daunting, um, if that would be a destination. Um, I think we've seen SAMRIC, SAMVAL, SAMOG for oil and gas, and SAM ESG can certainly exist as separate documents, but would definitely deserve collaborative formulation. I think that's that would be my first impression. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank, thanks, John. And uh, I think just to re-emphasize what I said a, a while ago, uh, Tanya, the, 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 there's definitely, a, without a doubt, a, a need for a, a working group uh, to synthesize all this information uh, canvas input from the whole spectrum of uh, multiple stakeholders uh, and, and put down a, a clear and concise set of minimum standards required uh, for resource and reserve reporting. But mm -hmm. uh, we need to keep it in context. Uh, and it, it's such a, uh, a potential explosion of, of a reporting burden. We need to keep in mind what, what is material what needs to be transparent. And ultimately, I think uh, the recipient of the information needs to understand the level of assurance and the level of risk management in place. And I think that's the, the do common denominator we always need to refer back to, to make sure there is value add rather than, as I said, potential data dumping of information, which would be need to be avoided. Uh, but before I move on to the next question, I'm just going to check the rest of the panel on Tanya's question. Uh, Yako, uh, any views? Thanks, Tim. 
Yeah, I mean, you probably need a committee to actually to uh, answer this question, uh, don't you, Tim? I mean, I suggest that, I mean, the first task of such a working committee would actually be to res try and resolve this issue um, because it can become quite complex, you know, because, uh, you know, some stage you might end up with a uh, SAMREC code that's too complicated or same ESG code that doesn't work. So maybe both of these codes must capture the material elements of each other. And then, uh, you know, one can maybe work from there. I don't know them, but I mean, it's going to be a process. I can see that. Uh, I totally agree uh, with you, Yako. And then the big first step would be to set out the, the scope of work and frame what the intention of an e, uh, a SAM ESG update uh, actually needs to achieve. So uh, I think before the, the process even starts, there should be absolute crystal clear clarity on what the end game and objective is uh, before we actually set off on that journey uh, of, a, of a, a SAM ESG uh, update. <clears throat> it's all too easy to, to explode the information available in the marketplace. Uh, we need to make sure it's, it's value adding all the way through. Uh, uh, thanks, Yako. Uh, and perhaps Char Charlene, uh, a last comment on, on Tanya's question. Thanks, Tim. Um, I, yeah, I think it could go either way, to be quite honest. And I think it needs to be what works and is most effective. I think both could work. There are probably instances out there where both could work. So um, uh, I, the only risk I see of having a sort of a separate ESG aspect is that, um, or ESG garden space is that then non-ESG people would leave it to the ESG people and then they wouldn't integrate or converge effectively. And I feel that that's perhaps one of the key messages that is coming out here is we have to do one that will allow for best integration. But there are practical challenges and opportunities doing it both ways. Tim, just to check in, Teresa's put a challenge to the delegates on the call um, or a question in the chat. And then there's two hands up, Linda Lani and Andrew. That's right. I, I, I was aware of the one question on the chat line, but uh, I'll, I'll hopefully have time to come back to that. Uh, I'm actually going to go to uh, Andrew McDonald, who, who has his hand up. Uh, Andrew, over to you. Yeah, morning. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everybody. So I was picking up on Tanya's question and your comment. Uh, I would concur with you to say that it should be incorporated into the SAMREC code. Um, because already you've got a lot of duplication between the reporting in the SAMES guidelines and the environmental social disclosure in the SAMREC code. Um, the other thing that I wanted to pick up on is that uh, in terms of a working group to formulate how this gets done, it would need to incorporate uh, people from the SAMVAL, from the valuation side as well, because that also has implications in terms of valuation of assets. Um, and just before I uh, finish, the, one of my burning concerns is the extent to which competent persons reports are getting longer and longer and longer. And apart from, as you called it, Tim, um, what did you call it, data dumping and materiality, the, the codes are becoming so much more, I'm going to say, prescriptive in terms of the level of detail that's got to be disclosed, that it's it's for anybody to try and wade through these reports and understand what's going on is becoming very, very difficult. So we need to think at the same time of how we can reduce the length of these reports and still give the key information. Thanks, that's all I want to say. Uh, Andrew, th thank you so much for those comments. Uh, we've set an internal challenge within Goldfields to uh, streamline our, our reporting to a certain level, because it, it, it's actually much more challenging to have a, a comprehensive competent persons report that's 100 pages long, it's much easier to make it 240 pages long. And I, I'll just throw a, a suggestion out here as well. Uh, the Goldfields financial team goes across to Washington on an annual basis to engage with the SEC to understand and be updated routinely on that exchange's expectations in reporting on what the current new trends are. Should there not be an opportunity for reporting under SAMREC for companies to engage with the JSE uh, over perhaps one or two days on an annual basis, just so we can have a, a quality collaboration and make sure everyone's aligned on expectations 
uh, and the best uh, current trends in reporting. I think that would be very healthy for the industry. Uh, thank, thanks very much for that. And uh, uh, Linda Lani, uh, your hand is up next. Uh, please, please go ahead with your question. Okay. Hi. Um, good, good morning, Tim. I'll just switch off my, my video. I don't know if everybody can hear me. Okay, that's fine. Um, I think Andrew just touched on what, some of the uh, issues that I wanted to raise. Um, I'll just pick up what when where Teresa ended yesterday uh, in terms of uh, the, the, there's quite a bit of overlap between various kinds of reports that we do, and each report has its own scope, you know, audience and also the frequency of reporting. So they come at different times, and I think the challenge for for from my side, which I see, is that you know, as as, as mineral mining companies, uh, we need to understand, and we uh, sort of how do we integrate all this uh, all this reporting. Uh, across across the organization. And then also touching on, you know, I think the, the, the issue we, we, we talked about, about integrating and cross-referencing between multiple reports, I think that requires more thinking and to actually uh, pave a way forward. How can we in, uh, do that? Mm -hmm. Also touching to what you said, Tim, in terms mm -hmm. of avoiding duplicate, duplication of, 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 of information in all of these reports. That's just a comment from my side. No, very relevant comment, and I think reinforcing uh, a lot of the key themes we've heard today, Linda Lani. So thanks for that. Uh, Shepard, uh, did, do you have any uh, observations at this point? Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't have any, 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 anything um, 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 major. Basically, just to highlight that um, it's important that all the different courts, you know, one is to understand what the requirements of the different courts are, you know, so that you know, there's no duplication. And, and also importantly, um, um, the requirements say from the summary record, you know, those essential requirements uh, that are to do with ESG must be reflected uh, in, in the summary record. But you see ESG also covers quite a lot of other, you know, other things as well. And um, so I think that needs to be taken into, into consideration because you also don't want to have you know, a, 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 you know, too much, uh, in, you know, uh, requirements, you know, say on the, on the summer quarter or, or summer, uh, but only have those, you know, that information that's relevant for the reporting of minerals as the mineral reserves. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, the ESG um, sort of, um, you know, larger component might cover a lot of other, other aspects as well. Right, Thank, thanks very much, Shepard. Uh, I'm cognizant of the time, but I think there are two really good points in the chat room, which I'd like to put pick up on. And uh, the first one is from uh, Leslie Jeffrey, who I hope is still on the call. You make a very good point about right sizing reporting obligations between uh, uh, big corporates uh, with multi jurisdictions uh, mm -hmm. and more micro entrepreneurs, which uh, are still a very important component of the industry, particularly in certain jurisdictions. Uh, Leslie, uh, would it be okay for you to just uh, repeat your question uh, on the call for us? Um, hi, Tim. Thank you. Just a bit of background. I was on the editing committee for the SANS 10320 guidelines, which are the coal reporting guidelines that work hand in hand with SAMREC. There are one or two instances in that document where there was, I won't call it a pitched battle, but there were some very earnest discussions about how something should be record, uh, reported because big business saw things in one way and had the resources to support that way. Whereas the small businesses, which on that committee were actually represented by consultants, the consultants knew those small businesses did not have the resources to satisfy those requirements, neither in-house nor the ability to pay for them in terms of, of consultants. And in fact, that that level of reporting could actually kill the micro business. So it, it's a very difficult trade-off between um, living in a perfect world and not killing off small business initiatives, which is why I say any panel needs a good range of industry sizes um, or business sizes across the industry to tease out those kind of issues and, and find a workable middle ground for all parties. Yeah, fully, fully supported. And it, it's an aspect that I think is too often overlooked 
so the the point is well made and and well uh, well recognized thanks for that uh, uh kelly did did you have your hand up just now i, th I think in terms of samrek and samrel and samob and samez remember that this they really only comply the, the the compliance is required through the jse listings rules so in essence smaller companies that follow it follow it um because they want to not necessarily because they have to so trying to make something for everybody is going to be quite difficult i think and i think if a smaller company wants to where the areas where they they can't actually comply then i suppose you should you, you should apply the if not why not kind of principle yeah no uh, agreed uh, I, uh, uh, john I, I don't know do, do you have an observation on, on kelly's comment other than to support it wholeheartedly, nothing to add, Tim. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank, thanks, Kelly. Uh, that that point's also taken uh, and also very important. Uh, I think uh, we we'll probably just finish off with me referring just back to the chat line. Uh, we're nearly at half past the uh, the hour, uh, and it's actually from uh, Linda. Uh, your comment was: Should the competent person? Uh, and you may be referring to the lead competent person for a mineral company who actually signs off on submissions either to the JSE or, or the SEC, et cetera. Uh, you say, should the competent person not, uh, should perhaps he should not be a, he or she should not be a single individual. Uh, I think implying that there, there might be a, a very clear role for discipline experts to contribute to the competent person's uh, overview uh, and to reach a, a position of satisfaction that they're all covered. Uh, do you perhaps want to briefly just expand on that uh, for us, Linda? Yeah, I, I am a geologist. So I'm learning now about this uh, uh, competent person because I'm teaching the mining engineers. So I had to learn that there is a competent, when I do the SUMREC code, there is a competent person that does the resource part of the SUMREC code. And then there is a, the user is a geologist. And then there is a competent person that is a mining engineer that does the reserves part of this. And I, since I never work in the industry because I'm an academic, I actually don't know how these two competent person, the resource side and the reserve side are dealing with each other. But now I see that uh, the reserves part of the uh, summary code that uh, it should be a mining engineer as also to look into these all modifying factors to convert resources into reserves. And there are so many variables that it cannot be the competence of a mining engineer. This is beyond it. And so this is why I said maybe one has to think of the significance of this competent person. And uh, I'm sorry if I don't know many things and new in this business. So this is my side. Thank you. No, no, thanks, Linda. And perhaps before I briefly go around the panel, uh, I just want to comment uh, uh, myself. I've been the lead competent person for resources and reserves for 15 years for goldfields. Uh, and one thing I've learned is you need to pragma be pragmatic and realistic. You cannot be an expert uh, in every aspect, whether it's geology, mining, engineering, finance, ESG, processing, etc. You have to rely on a competent person's team in support of you. Uh, in, in my particular case, I, I rely uh, extensively on Charlene and, and her team that cover uh, mine closure, provisions, uh, community engagement, uh, water, security of water, uh, security of energy, et cetera, uh, leasing agreements, et cetera. All, all that uh, is made available to me to review, but there are discipline experts within goldfields that have the true competency to review and sign off on that. So it, ultimately, it has to be a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, and perhaps I, I could, uh, on, on behalf of perhaps Yako and Shepard, if you are lecturing at the university and you may need someone to come in from industry who could perhaps give uh, a presentation to the students uh, or the postgraduates on, on exactly what this entails, uh, we might be able to uh, assist you there. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll it. it would be great yep. also to for having the student to have uh, someone from the industry speaking about that, and not only me from the theoretical part, but more a practical part. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we the, the 
the clock has run out on us, but uh, I'm, I'm just going to close out by going around the panel uh, for any last comments or observations. Uh, and I'll kick off, uh, Shepard, with yourself. Any closing remarks? Shepard, any closing remarks? No, uh, Yako, uh, any closing remarks from your side? Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be on the panel. I think it um, solicited some good discussions and some good points that came out, come out for, um, you know, follow up. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yako. And uh, John? Nothing specific to add other than to thank my co-panelists and Tim and Charlene for this marvelous um, presentation and the audience for this very, very helpful interactive session uh we've got some work to do thanks very much yeah thanks john uh, charlene any last words from your side thank you tim i would just like to echo yaku and john's thanks to my co-panelists to the geological society tanya fiona and of course yourself and i think very importantly thank you to all the attendees who who put some really good questions and thoughts on the table I think the challenges are, are actually quite well understood and there's there's some very clear direction on what can be tackled first going forwards, which I think is a great position to be in. So thank you very much to everyone. Thanks, Charlene. And uh, I won't repeat everything, but I fully echo and endorse uh, what Yako, uh, Charlene and, and John have just said. Uh, and, and my final comment would be, I, I think we have an opportunity as an industry, uh, particularly focused, uh, I think, today, uh, on uh, SAMREC, SAM ESG, SAMVAL and the JSE, we have a great opportunity to differentiate our industry and our reporting regime from others around the world by moving on this with some real traction and momentum in the next 12 months. And, and I think we can raise the bar uh, and, and really set the new standard for this uh, in integration of ESG in sustainable resource and reserve reporting. So uh, I agree there's much work to be done, but I think we've got quite a strong feeling of what that roadmap uh, needs to look like. Uh, so that's all from uh, this particular uh, panel session. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Tim. And thank you uh, to, to um, all the panel speakers. Thanks for your presentation, Charlene, also. Okay, it's 11.45. I think we can start to resume again. I'm gonna hand you over to the, the final panel discussion that's gonna be moderated by Nicole. And it's over to you, Nicole. Thanks, Fiona. Um, okay, so this section of the um, workshop or discussion is specifically centered around competent persons reports. And, um, you know, we'll go sort of a bit more into the works as, as we go through, I think. What I'd like to just start with is to introduce ourselves, myself and, and the, the rest of the panelists. So I think if I can ask them all just to, um, you know, give a brief introduction of themselves and, you know, where they would necessarily fit in uh, with this conversation and, and their field of expertise. Um, so myself, I'm currently the CP for our uh, PGM segment at Sabanya Stillwater. I've been in the industry for, for 15 years. Um, so in terms of that, you know, it's, it's compiling the, the CP reports, the annual um, resource and reserve statements. Um, so that's where I fit into in, in this particular discussion. Um, I think if I'll just go down the line, Lindalani. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's Lindalani Mudimeri. Um, I'm currently the CP for Sibanya Stillwater, the Gold Division. Um, so basically, my role is compiling the CP reports, CPR reports, and also the R and R reports uh, for the on, on annual basis. Thanks, Nicole. And then we have Andy, Andy McDonald. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I've been doing competent persons reports for listing since uh, 1999. I've been involved on the Samrec, uh, sorry, the Samval committee in terms of the rewrite of the Samval code, um, and learning quite a lot about ESG in, in a very short space of time. So thank you. Thanks, Andy. And then we have Kelly. Hi, um, I'm basically, I've been in the mining industry for 
uh, 25 plus years. I focus really on mineral asset valuations, um, M&A type work, project evaluations um, as an independent consultant. Um, I was part of the SAMVAL rewrite and I've been on the SAMVAL and SAMREC committees um, for many years. And I was chairperson of the SAMVAL committee from 2015 to 2019, which was during the time that we rewrote the SAMVAL code. And just as part of that, when we were writing the, the SAMVAL code, one of the things that we did add into the SAMVAL code, and I think I've said this before in table 1.10, is that SAMES should be used as a guideline in terms of your valuation. So I think it is quite well embedded in the SAMVAL code. It does give you some, some flexibility, but I think it is actually already embedded in the SAMVAL code. Thanks. Thanks. And then we have Neil. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, so with, with my association of Deloitte, I often have to introduce myself and explain that I'm not an auditor um, and I'm not an accountant. So I'm, I'm a geologist by background. Um, I represent a business called Deloitte Technical Mining Advisory. So we are the sort of technocrats within uh, the accounting or financial advisory business. I do have a history in um, writing and contributing to CPRs and valuation reports. But nowadays, more of a user of these reports. Uh, a lot of my time is spent working with banks, financial institutions, or funds, uh, trying to understand the risks and opportunities associated with mineral projects and, and the like, um, and putting values on these projects and opportunities. Um, so, so I'll be looking through, through the lens of a user of these reports, uh, some of the challenges that we are seeing, um, um, and some of the requirements um, in terms of uh, ESG reporting through the CPRs for the purpose of the end user. Great, thank you, Neil. Uh, thank you, everyone. Okay, so the discussion that we're going to have is going to be a little bit different to the others. So in terms of a structure, um, what we'd like to do is, you know, we'll have a very brief introduction and the panelists will, will sort of chip in with, with their experience or comments as we go. Um, and then what we'd like to do is, is pose some questions, you know, have sort of a high level question um, in terms of discussion points, and then basically open it up to, to the panel, to, to everybody on, on the call, you know, for, for comments and discussion, just so that we can get some, you know, valuable input from everybody on the, um, the discussion. It's not for us to, to talk around too much today. So that's just the, the structure we'll be following from, from our, our side. So just a brief introduction. I mean, we've had a lot of talk the last two days um, about ESG and its, its importance. Um, and naturally, you know, as we've heard, there's a growing concern from investors and other stakeholders that the companies disclose more about their um, ESG strategies, um, their governance, that, you know, how, how they manage the, the risks. Um, and there's, there's both qualitative and quantitative metrics that companies use um, to describe their performance against these risks, um, you know, opportunities that they have and the, the strategies that they have in place. And I think it's important that um, investors can engage based on what is disclosed, um, you know, where, where the company's focus is, you know, their risk mitigation, the strategies they have in place, um, and ultimately their delivery on, on sustainable returns um, in the long run. I think it's, it's key to remember that, that we have to deal with this correctly now so that you know future generations still still have something to to look back on and i think that's something i'd, I'd like to stress is that you know from from all the discussions that that we've had if we get it right now in terms of you know what we disclose going forward standardization you know all the, the different topics in terms of um esg it just makes it a lot easier going going forward for everybody else to to know what what's important what the key focus points um are and you know for me it's about mostly the the, the transparency um, if you're transparent if you're open if you're honest and you disclose what is important to you as a company um, and you know what ultimately what factors your your shareholders derive the most value from in that disclosure um, you know that that should be um, sort of at, at the top of your list um, you know other points to remember is obviously the, the, the main things being the financial um, impacts. Um, and, and also, I think, particularly when we're talking about mineral resource and reserve reporting, is, is what factors are going to be practical? Um, we'll discuss CPRs as, as we go, but you know, what, what's practical from 
um, building these documents, which are already huge and big and bulky. Um, you know, how can we streamline these processes? How can we take out or, or deal with that complexity, reduce that complexity in the reports that, that we produce so that they don't become too bulky and cumbersome and, and people don't end up reading them or, you know, extracting value out of them becomes an, an issue. And I think a challenge that, that everyone is, is struggling with at this stage is that, you know, the varying reporting standards and frameworks in some way can, ha can hamper a, a company's um, efforts to report meaningful data. You know, they're not sure what's important, what's not, and they end up disclosing things that they necessarily don't need to, you know, in, in that way, bulking up things. So, you know, the, these are all things that, that we need to keep in mind, I think, when we look at specifically our... Um, our components, you know, what are we reporting? Is it important? Is it material? Materiality is obviously one of the most important. And I also think we need to, 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 to bring that transparency as we do with, with our mineral resource and, and reserve um, reporting. Transparency is key. So I'll move on to, um, you know, the intention of a CPR is, is it's a technical report compiled by the competent person. And the, con or the, the intention, I would say, of the CPR, as we know, is that, you know, specifically for the JSE, um, now with the, the SEC, um, all, you know, all the other um, le legislative bodies, is that typically the CPR is um, disclosed once or, or loaded once with the JSE, um, you know, if it's a new listing or if there's a material change um, in the mine or the property. Um, so, you know, maybe just a comment here is that, the CPRs, you know, it's it's not not necessarily an annual thing. Some companies may may update them annually, and that's their decision. But um, it's almost a, stat, a static snapshot in that point in time. And with ESG factors, I think it's important to remember that everyone's now scrambling to try and make sure they're compliant and having all these these factors. But ESG factors are not static. It's 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 a continuous process that has to happen day to day. So is the CPR the correct place to put focus on ESG matters? There already is a lot in incorporated in, in CPRs um, as driven by the, the, the code um, in the tables. We see it in both uh, SAMREX and VAL um, and the, the SAM ESG itself provides guidance as to what um, could support these, these reports. But it's important to remember that CPR is not a sustainability report, you know, it's not an EIA. And by adding too much information, as I've already said, it, will it not make it too, too big and bulky? I mean, for example, um, we had a SAMRA committee discussion and some of these documents are coming out to be 700, 800 pages. And, you know, people like Neil or investors or, you know, people that get hold of these documents, it's, it's a huge amount of, of data to sift through and to see you know, what is material, what is, what is not. So I think from a CPR perspective, we need to be very careful to be too prescriptive as to what we put in the um, SEMESG guideline to say, you know, you have to include this and this. And, and like been, has been raised previously from, from other people is um, we have to be careful of overlaps and duplication. You know, it, it may be of more value in a CPR to reference other reports, um, which, which is widely done. So that may be the answer from a CPR perspective is that where you can reference, you reference um, what is necessary as prescribed by the JSC um, or in the, the codes, you know, those things are naturally included. Um, but, you know, the, the detail, I think the, the devil is in the detail is, is how much detail, you know, how, what do we disclose? What is important to disclose? And we'll, we'll go through that as we, we have the, um, the discussion. So, you know, this was just an in interesting infographic that, that I picked up, you know, just for some people that, that may not understand, you know, what's all encompassed. And, and I think the comment here is that you see there's a huge um, amount of, of topics that's covered in, in all, all three of the pillars. And, you know, to focus and have some aspect of, of all of these and more included in a specifically a CPR report it's just going to get too, too massive. And, and that's where the, the linking and the, the referencing, I think, is, is going to come in here. Um, so I think um, if, if I just go back to, to this one here, um, I'd like possibly if, if any of the panelists have, have comments, you know, in, on specifically their experience of a CPR, the intention of a CPR, 
and you know what what their feeling is in terms of um, what to incorporate, what not to incorporate, and how we deal with um, ESG matters specifically in a CPR report. If anyone wants to comment, I'm happy to kick off. Um, maybe with nice. just just posing another challenge. Um, and, and probably more broadly than just this panel um, the, 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 to the rest of the delegates too. I mean, uh, Nicole, I agree with your statement around a CPR not purporting to be a sustainability report. And I think equally, we should be very wary of creating a position where a CP is required to or purports to be an ESG expert. Um, I think, you know, there's a, there's a lot of responsibility a CP takes um, already um, we, we will later on in this discussion, no doubt, talk about consultation and the importance of understanding all of the ESG elements. But I would just also caution about any process that forces a CP to take on more responsibility that they, than they are competent to do. Um, I think what we are seeing in industry is far too many people claiming to be ESG experts or doing limited training and and, and, and putting forward uh, ESG credentials on that basis. Um, in, in, in my experience, it's very difficult to define what an ESG expert is, for example. Um, so I would just throw that out as a potential challenge as well. Thanks, Neil. Nicole? Can I just make a point on, on that as well? I mean, I think that, that, that Neil is right. I mean, a competent person does take on quite a lot of responsibility. But there is all, I mean, you do have all your technical experts that actually do input into a, C, a CPR and a resource and reserve statement. And the CP does depend on those people. And obviously, in a way, they do have to vouch for those people. So I suppose it's important for the CP to be able to rely on those people. And I think the same would be the case in the case of ESG aspects is that the CP or the CV would actually have to rely on those people. As a competent evaluator, I rely on many people in terms of their inputs into evaluation and ESG is no real difference. There's no real difference. I mean, I rely on an ESG person or people um, to provide the necessary inputs for a competent evaluation. And Nicole, my take is this. I recall back in the middle 2000s of having extensive discussions with um, people that were on the committee for the NI43101 and that the whole emphasis on the report was that of a summary, uh, a summary of technical aspects. Now, there's been lots of reference made this morning, particularly by Tim, to the SK1300 reporting requirements for the SEC. Now, that follows a very similar format to the NI43101 uh, method of reporting. And again, the, the whole the report is called a technical report summary. The issue now comes down is, is to how do you get the right level of, of detail in to satisfy all your report, reporting requirements and still maintain that of a summary. And uh, the minute you have to start referring to other documents, uh, appendices and the like, it just becomes very difficult to follow the flow of an argument. So we have to find a way of condensing, summarizing and getting the key information across as, as Tim mentioned this morning, what is material? It's not data dumping. Put in the material items, those items that really are going to be of significance to the, the entity, the operation, the project. And in days gone by, we used to use materiality as anything that was going to affect the bottom line by more than 10%. Um, but that doesn't necessarily apply to all things. And as we discussed yesterday, governance matters when it comes to uh, corporate uh, what's the word, um, the, one's image in the marketplace, a very small event could actually be quite devastating in terms of your overall image. So it's, it's a question of getting the balance right. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Um, I think, you know, I'll, I'll pick up on that. And, and specifically, you know, Linda Lani can also possibly weigh in here. Um, we've just, as Sabanya, been through a process of building our technical report summaries. And um, obviously, there's very specific requirements there um, and it, it's it was a huge exercise you know specifically um, from the environmental sections and and closure and you know all of, all of those types of things so I hear you what you say is that you know it's the intention is that it's it's a summary but these documents ended up being massive and unfortunately um, you have to build one for each of your what they would term material properties 
Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's multiple massive documents that you have to, to put together. So, you know, as you say, it's, it's quite onerous for the CP um, to, to, to collate this and, and put this all together and, and ensure that the level of reporting is, is correct, that it's, it's, it's more a summary than listing, you know, all the environmental reports or, or the strategies or, or those kinds of things. Unfortunately, there are specific requirements. And, you know, how, how do you get away with that by, as you say, adding enough data um, but not just dumping data for the sake of having to, to, to be compliant. So it's, it's a very fine line between, um, you know, what has to be disclosed and, and what's, what's not necessary, but you feel, um, you know, you, you want to be a bit more transparent and, and you, you disclose a bit too much sometimes. So that's, that's the, the, the tricky one. Um, but, but I think the comment remains. These, these documents are, are massive. And if, if you add too much um, detail and, and emphasis on the, the wrong things, it, it can just very quickly um, go off on a tangent. And I think this is the role that Sam Esk needs to play to help focus on, what's, on what is important for the purposes of a CPR. So again, accepting that this is not a, you know, a, a full sustainability report, there's still a very specific requirement for that. But you know, when it comes to reporting on specific ESG matters, it, it, it needs to be related to what, what relevance it has to the, the resource and reserve statement. So, you know, we, I, I, what I too often see is a, a sort of checklist process where a specific aspect is reported on factually, but there is no um, link to the, um, the impact it has on the modifying factors or the resource or reserve statement. I think whenever an environmental aspect is mentioned, there needs to be very clear guidance as to why we are including it. If there's no specific reason or link to the RNR statement, then arguably it belongs in the sustainability report or some sort of reference to that. Uh, because I fully agree these reports do need to be simplified. They do need to be more tabulated and graphical uh, with less detail, but still focusing on what is material. Um, so yeah, that's that's the balance that needs to be struck, I think. Uh, Nicole, just from my side, um, uh, following on what Neil just said, I think we for we need clear guidance uh, in terms of how do we report at different levels of reporting um, a, a period. Um, I think there's for specific ESG matters, we just need to have a detailed requirements for each uh, process. And then we, we sort of avoid the issue of duplication or, or data dumping as we, we saw with the technical report summaries to sort of re report mostly on issues that are material uh, uh, to the business at that particular time. Yeah, I think to pick up Linda Lani, as you say, you know, each company would obviously have its own, own specific um, strategy and, you know, focus areas. So I think if, the, if that's clear right in the beginning, you know, down the line in terms of reporting, um, you, it, it can take the complexity out of that. Is that you know what is specific to you? Um, you know specifically for us on the resource and the reserve side that it's you know where the focus points are, um, things that can influence the resource um, and reserve reporting. Um, and you know Neil and I had a discussion, and and his his comment was was very valid. Is that it also doesn't help that we have it in the summary or we 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 um, we give a comment and say you know this aspect. Um, could influence the RPEE, for example. There needs to be integration with how all of these things work together, um, and you know the, the potential effects. Um, you know, Tim said it previously is that, or, or somebody was talking about reconciliation, and you know, it is um, possibly disclosing you know what's come in, what's come out, specifically because of these ESG. I mean. With RPEE, we focus on things like, you know, stuff that comes out because of, of grade or structural complexity or, or those types of things. It, it could be exactly the same with ESG, is that, um, you know, it's an environmentally sensitive area. We cannot access that ground. Therefore, we take it out of our resource. Um, so it's just going into that level of, of detail when you do identify material risks, as Mindalani had said, is that, you know, just focus on those very specific points um, and not, you know, inflate this thing to, to be too massive. Okay, so I, I think if, if the panelists don't really have too much more to say on, you know, the CPR report specifically, I think what we'd like to do is we'll go to the first question. 
what we'll do is we'll we'll pose a question and you know it, it we can just generate some discussion um and i think maybe how we should kick this one off is is look at the different examples of what different companies are doing um in terms of their um esg reporting within their cprs currently um you know things we can possibly discuss is how it's applied to rp triple e um you know what would the impact be on life of mine plans um, what, what are the legal requirements in terms of the JSE? What has to be reported in terms of ESG? And I think it's important to note here, and this has been a theme throughout the, the discussions, is that one size does not fit all. And, you know, major corporates have teams of people creating these sustainability reports, um, whereas the, the smaller businesses or, you know, the, the juniors don't necessarily have that level of detail. They don't have the people to, to do that. So I think when you become too prescriptive and we, you know, we had a, a panelist discussion earlier in the week, if you become too prescriptive in terms of what you need to incorporate in these reports, it, it can be limiting. So, you know, these smaller companies will have to then spend the, the money to get external people to come and do these studies for them. Um, so, it, it, you know, we also need to, I think, be careful in terms of being um, too prescriptive, you know, as to what we include and what we, we exclude. So I think if there's any comments or questions, um, you know, or, or maybe experiences you can share with us in terms of what your company is doing or, or you as a consultancy have done for clients in terms of CPRs and, you know, the incorporation of the ESG aspects. Um, I know that obviously the E and S component um, is covered. If you maybe have some discussion on the governance, which, you know, we'll, we'll get into later. Um, so I think... We'll open the floor now if, if, if anybody would like to um, to raise any questions, you know, on this point specifically. Uh, Bruce Williamson has a hand up. Bruce? Yeah, uh, hi, good day. Um, just, you know, this whole issue of not being too prescriptive, I, I sort of <laughs> I buy into a lot of that. However, with an investor hat sitting here, if we're looking at not only the South African resource market, but also listed companies around the world, it then puts a lot of pressure on investors to start working out, well, who is abiding by which set of guidelines, which rules? And so you're really passing the ball to the investor. And, and then what happens is they give up because as you've pointed out, the large companies have the wherewithal to to really do a great job. And so investors say, look, you know what? The bottom 80% of the market, I'm just going to ignore and I'll just invest in the top 20. So how do we prevent that? Okay. I don't know if any of my panelists have any comments on that. Um, I think just, just, you know, from my side, I think when we talk about not being too, too prescriptive, um, you know, if you look at all the other codes, um, typically what, what they would give is, is guidelines because obviously, you know, different companies would have different focus points. So I think what a guideline maybe allows more so than actually being so prescriptive in saying, you know, these are the exact points is that you can have different, um, is that there's different, different focuses, um, you know, different levels of, of reporting and, um, the, the, the current guideline basically says that, you know, the, it's the same um, for, for all the different levels of um, resources. And, you know, there is some, some basic um, guideline in terms of what to include in, in a report. But I think what we mean by prescriptive is giving very specific, for example, modifying factors. Um, it's difficult to do things like that because, you know, obviously everyone has different factors that they um, consider when, you know, going from resource to reserve. Um, from an ESG perspective, um, again, like I said, it's, it, it could be different for, for everybody. So I think in that sense, you know, if, if you're too prescriptive, it can become limiting. But I hear what you say. I mean, 100 percent, there has to be some guidance so that, you know, across the board, um, as I said, if, if we start now and, and right at the beginning, we have things um, clear cut so that everybody understands and knows which way to go forward. Um, it, it can take a lot of that um, confusion out. Um, and, and an interesting perspective, Bruce, as you say, is that, um, you know, investors obviously don't want to have to spend the time, you know, digging and trying to find the information um, and that they would necessarily say, okay, we go with the bigger corporates who have the, the time and the, the resources. So it's, it's, it's quite an important um, comment to, to, to keep in mind. So thank you for that. 
It's, it's maybe also not just um, just the, the size of the corporate, but maybe the capacity of the um, the external consultants compiling these reports potentially. So, you know, the, some organizations have expertise across all disciplines, including ESG, and you would see an ESG expert as an author on those reports. But far too often we're seeing reports that don't have any sign off by an ESG person at all, or it's a one man band. Um, and that needs to be considered as well. So Bruce, I think you, you raise quite a, a relevant challenge here. Um, and you know, I would suggest again that, that, that this is the role that um, Sam Esk should be playing, uh, but in a fully integrated way with, uh, with, with the SAMREC and Sam, Sam Velcoat. I think this point's been raised a few times, you know, there, there's lots of value in this code, but it's being underutilized. Um, it's, it's certainly not being referenced in any of the reports I read. It might be considered, um, but it should, in my mind, be fully integrated. And that would be a good starting point. But I would push it up even further. Um, I, I would think that this is a responsibility of Crisco, um, because what we're talking about here is a level playing field. And if we can have simplified, standardized reporting at Crisco level, then that should filter all the way down. The problem is we're we're, we're trying to do this at Samrec, Samval level, and 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 set the example for the rest of the industry. And and that's possibly not the best way of of creating that level playing field. Thanks, Neil. Um, Tim, you have a question. Yeah, um, Nicole, uh, just an observation here. Uh, obviously, from a technical perspective, when companies report uh, indicated in inferred resources and proved and probable reserves and net present values, etc., that's all fairly standard, and the, the playing field is, is pretty level, uh, thanks to Sa uh, Samrec. But uh, if you look at investors, potential investors or other stakeholders looking at reporting to understand ESG, they want a, a, a quick and effective way of understanding, is this company got the appropriate ESG assurance uh, and risk management in place? Now, at, at the moment, I, I think it's anything but a level playing field. And, and ultimately, the industry just need, does need a, a set of minimum standards, and there'll always be those top quartile companies with the money and resources to perhaps uh, uh, shine as, as leading practitioners. But uh, I, I looked at, uh, along with Charlene, we, we had a, a strong look at, uh, here's a contextual example, uh, mine closure cost estimates. These have the potential to run uh, mature mining operations into negative NPV territory. Uh, and even within goldfields, we had some people challenging us saying, we don't believe it should be part of a life of mine cash flow model. A mine closure cost estimate and obligation and provisions is something for the never never. Well, I, I canvassed the entire industry. I think the 10 leading global mining consultancies a couple of months ago, just to see if there was consistency in, in how mining cost provisions should be handled in competent person reports. And quite surprisingly, there was probably 90% alignment between mining consultancies I canvassed in Vancouver, Toronto, Brisbane, Perth, South Africa, uh, Lima, et cetera. And, and this is a, perhaps a microcosm example, but I would want a SAM ESG guideline to say that a, a, a life of mine reserve cash flow model needs to appropriately uh, reflect the mine closure cost estimates, provisions, and potentially even post-closure uh, obligations, which could, could be in the guise of uh, water management, uh, et cetera. Uh, and that, that, that's just an example of where I think guidance does have to be given to the industry. Otherwise, we'll have some reserves on companies' books that maybe shouldn't, and vice versa, uh, just using the example of mine closure costs. So that, there's just something else to throw into the mix there, Nicole. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. 100%. And, and I think, um, you know, from from the survey and results from the survey and just, just discussions in the chat, um, you know, there is sort of more leaning towards, um, you know, having a lot more clear guidance in terms of what to include and what not to. So, you know, like, like we said, you know, obviously every company is different and they will have different focus points. But I think if, if the guidelines are um, workshopped 
and 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 put together in in a way that um, you can still have some interpretation or application to to your commodity um, mine project, whatever it will, will be, that would definitely go a long way in, in, in assisting um, CPs to, to report the correct things. Andy, you, you have a comment? Yeah, just, just picking up from what Tim was saying, I mean, one of the other things which I often see is not included in cash flow models for life of mine plans is your downsizing cost of your staff as your, as your um, production starts ramping down. Um, and also if the mine gets to the end of its mine life, there's often no provision for the downsizing or reskilling of your, your, of your staff. And that is, while it can be many years in the future, it's still a, can be quite a substantial cost. 100% Andy. Um, you know, and, and, and the question I think there is, is to what level of guidance should the, the SAM ESG go to? That's, you know, that's something that needs to be workshopped and we're not going to hash it out here. But, you know, all of these are very good examples of, of things that could, as you say, level the playing field and, and give clear guidance on, on what, um, what, what is expected. Um, I think, with sorry. The, with, the down, with the downsizing or the, the retrenchment, et cetera, that isn't generally a provision within the SLP. Uh, that mm. provision needs to be made for that. Uh, but it's only in South Africa that we have such a document. And for the, any of the other jurisdictions, I don't know that the same sort of thing exists. Just a comment in general, in terms of mine closure planning and how this links in with the, the life of mine cash flow estimates is, in our experience, from my consulting company's experience, that is not SAMEs, there's many flaws in many of the mine closure plans and that those closure plans don't talk to or don't adequately talk to the social closure um, planning component. So, so reskilling of employees is one very small component of an overall mine closure planning social closure cost. But there's a whole lot of other costs that these mine closure plans don't adequately consider. Example, what to do with social infrastructure, um, the handover of that, the repurposing of that, all of those kind of things are often um, paid inadequate attention in many mine closure plans. Um, and if those mine closure plans are being relied on by CPs or by um, preparers of, of annual reports, then you're not going to have a life mine cash flow forecast that is, is correct because there's, there's, there's gaps um, in the, the sort of underlying document. And so I think that's a, a challenge for the mining industry is to, is really we need to upskill and improve the quality of all these underlying documents so that the, a document like a, a mineral reserve and resource statement, something that's updated annually, that draws on these documents actually has adequate and reliable information and, um, you know, to feed into it. Because it's only as good as the, the assumptions that, that these reports are based on. Thanks, Teresa. That, that's a great point. And I think it comes back to, you know, as we say, that these are not static issues. So these are things that, that we need to deal with, with annually. And I think when we're looking at CPRs, like we said, it's, it may be a, a snapshot in time, but we need to look at where in our other reporting, you know, these, these, these key issues um, are, are dealt with. Um, but, you know, will it then require, um, for example, rewrites of CPRs or updates of CPRs to, to include, um, you know, new guidelines, those types of things? Um, you know, obviously, CPRs are sent off, off to the, the JSE, and, and my understanding is that, you know, they're not necessarily looking at a rewrite to include um, any of, of these issues. Uh, you know, like Neil said, we're sort of taking it on ourselves to, to, to create this guideline. So, you know, are, are we creating a situation for ourselves where we've put together this, this guideline now, which then requires, you know, updating of these CPR reports. Um, you know, naturally the annual reports um, will get updated um, as, as the process allows, but will we then have to go back and revisit CPRs um, to include the, the new information to correct, um, you know, these financial valuations? Um, is that sustainable? Do, and, you know, do, do we have the time to, to go and do that? So I think it's, it's something we, we need to think about. Um, so, Nicole, I would second what you've just said. Um, from an accounting perspective, you only recognize a liability when you have an unavoidable obligation. So as much as the social labor plan talks about what your plans are with regard to retrenchment costs, 
those don't appear in the financial results because the accounting rules indicate that you have to be able to say, identify this unavoidable obligation. And because I can't identify the actual employees that they're gonna be retrenching in X number of years time, because I can't identify what their salary is, that from an accounting perspective is a contingent obligation. So there's no number of the accounts. And I also caution about the rabbit hole you might be potentially going down. Because if we're gonna follow Tim's concept that reserves wouldn't be reported if they're effectively gonna be used to justify what I'm perceiving he was what he was saying, you wouldn't report a reserve that's gonna be justified to offset the negative cash flows. Well, when a mining entity puts its mine up for disposal, those negative cash flows are no longer gonna happen. So those reserves exist again. And again, you might be creating all of these new CPR reports purely because of management decisions to exit a location and suddenly putting out into the market, oh, we've got these increased reserves, and by the way, we're selling it. Well, you're only selling it because you haven't got the liability anymore. You're only, your reserves are a consequence of the non-liability. They're not a consequence of your intention to continually mine. Hi, can I just make a comment in terms of what Kevin has said? I think, Kevin, you, we've got to actually distinguish between sort of accounting, which is sort of an annualized thing and something that's a CPR, and particularly the valuation component that is included in a CPR. A valuation would necessarily include something, say, at the end of life of mine. So if your, if your um, life of mine is only 10 years, um, chances are you're going to have to include some form of, of um, social closure cost in, in your um, CPR because it's a requirement for your valuation. So I think there are, there is, there is elements where you're actually going to need to do all of these things. And Kelly, I'm totally on your page. It's how we express that to the investor because the investor could might then get very confused if in one set of documents they see some narrative and some numbers and in another set of documents those numbers don't exist because the rules for the preparation of that document are different. And it's how we yeah, reconcile but, the two information flows. Yeah, but remember, accounting is you basically, I mean, accounting is fundamentally historical. No, um, no. Well, yes, it is. You're actually basically <laughs> showing what's actually happened in, in, the, in the year that's just, just happened. No. When you're looking at evaluation, you're looking forward. And, and accounting uses forward as well. That's where you apply the going concern concept. And so that if you identify that there's an event in the future, that's, that you can't avoid, you create that liability today. Yeah, but as you say, I mean, it could be a contingent liability because it's not, it not necessarily exists at this point in time in such a way that you can quantify it. But in evaluation, yeah. because you're forward looking and you're looking at cash flows going forward, it is part of your cash flows that as much as your, your environmental closure liabilities, there you've got a social liability and that needs to be included. Agreed from a Sam Val from, from the perspective that you're working with, but in determining whether I have an impairment by looking at future cash flows, I wouldn't include it. If it's no, I, no, I so you see, we yeah. do have two different, we, that's why I say the, the valuation could say a mine is worth $500 million, but from an accounting perspective where I'm showing an asset of $700 million, I might say I've got no impairment. And we would need to be able to rationalize to the investor why both numbers are right, even though they give conflicting information. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think there, there, <laughs> there is a point to that. But remember, in, in, in your accounting, you're not really valuing a company. I mean, in your accounts, it's not, yes, you may actually have going concern issues and you may have contingent liabilities and liabilities, but they're all from past events. Um, now, when, every year, Every year, we have to do a, an accounting determined valuation, not a sand valve, in order to determine if there's an impairment indicator. So if a, if a mineral price was to suddenly drop, and that looks like it's long term, that's an impairment indicator. 
And then we would have to determine whether the future cash flows from the remaining reserves and potential resource conversion would justify the current carrying value. So there's, 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 those requirements are required annually. Yeah. No, no, I get, we, I get two that. different but answers. It, yeah, no, I do. And then, but I mean, I've actually been involved in impairment um, calculations and valuations. Um, what I'm just saying is that fundamentally, yes, you, you actually do those impairment calculations and you may or may not raise an, imp you, you may land up with an impairment, but you don't fundamentally say to the shareholders that the company is valued at this. No. So that's well, the difference. When you um, actually do a valuation, you actually do actually a, put yeah. a, a number onto that valuation. So this, if, there if is you, a slight, slightly there's different. A, there's a difference. Yeah, there's a difference. And that's why I say there's a, a concern that we may end up in a rabbit hole where because of those differences that we can all work out, the investor may not be that astute and he may end up being very confused. Okay, I don't, I don't specifically think so, but um, that's just my opinion. Okay, I think um, let's move off of this one and we'll, we'll move to the next. You know, a big part of um, the, the discussion is, is, you know, what modifying factors do we, um, do we include, if anything, do, are we prescriptive? Um, you know, currently it gives broad, broad topics in terms of what um, modifying factors we apply in both SAMRIC and SAMVEL. Um, you know, and, and the ENS factors are known, you know, we're already applying those to um, our valuations. And, and I think what, what I'd like to do is, is, is draw Andy in here is, you know, what about the governance aspects? And you would have seen that there were some um, that, that were listed in, this, in the survey. Um, and I think if, if Andy, if you, if you could weigh in here, you know, how do, how do we quantify these, um, these governance issues and, and should they form part of um, uh, as CPR specifically. Well, Nicole, if you go back to your earlier slide where you've got those, uh, the, the, the various building blocks of the three components. And if you look in, in there as to what the components of governance are, they are in many instances intangibles that we can't really put a value to, um, that the board has got the right composition or that they've got the right purchasing strategy in there or that those sort of things. So what I what I picked up when in when I found that a reference on the JSC website to the way they do their ESG um, monitoring is that it, it's it's almost like a risk, a qualitative risk assessment type process where they have the two two axes that they then rate a, a, a given company on its reporting against those two criteria. And then they come up with some sort of scores to how well they performed and all of those things. This to me is the, is the big imponderable is, is on the governance matters because, I mean, if you, you just got to take Steinhoff and Tongart and EOH has all been category one JSC companies that are all uh, part of big corporate issues over the last few years. Uh, even the the skilled auditors uh, weren't, weren't able to pick those up. And how do you put a value on those issues? How do you determine what the cost is? I mean, that to me is a, is a big imponderable and I have no way at the moment of advising or even suggesting how it, how it could be done. But while everybody's been talking, I thought uh, there is a way of simplifying and I'm gonna say this very tongue in cheek a very easy way to simplify all these ESG matters. And that is that the ESG guidelines set down a set of specific criteria for each of these building blocks here that you've got for environmental, social, and governance. And then in, in any form of public report, it's a simple case of environmental pillar one, does it comply to these criteria, yes or no? If it's yes, fine, tick, if it's no, no, and you, then at the end of it, you weigh up all the, all the yeses and the noes, and if you've got more yeses than noes, then you're doing okay. I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Andy. I don't know if anybody else has any ideas in terms of specifically the, the governance portion and, you know, how we deal with that in, in our specific space. Nicole, Teresa here. I think the, you're right. The governance is really difficult um, to, to quantify because typically where you get the biggest governance risks is where companies don't have the processes in place. And so 
you, you need to ask your question your, yourself whether or not a company would disclose that they they don't govern themselves you know in line with say common corporate governance principles so so i think governance needs to be largely around the transparency and the disclosures because investors can then make their own informed decisions as to whether they consider those governance processes to be adequate for that company. I think it's quite difficult to put a, a, a rand or dollar value to those things. And that the more transparently companies disclose the way that they govern themselves and the, the processes they have in place, I think the I think that's in in my personal opinion how how we need to address governance. Um, because you 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 can't value it or people won't be honest about it. That's that's my view. Yeah, I think that's a good comment in terms of transparency. Um, you know, the, there was a comment from Fioli in the chat um, earlier is that I think that if if we display an understanding of the modifying factors we've used, then they don't necessarily need to be numbers or, or figures that, that are, are thrown around. If, if you really understand them and you, you show the understanding and the, the, the description and, and you give the data and the information, you know, that, that should be good enough in terms of, of disclosure. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, we have to um, deal with it from a quantification perspective, but it, it comes back to the, the question is in a, in a CPR, which is a technical document, um, you know, do we even have to mention those things or, or do we just reference, you know, other, other reports? Um, is, is it just going to bulk the reports up with, with things that may not necessarily be um, in our jurisdiction, if, if, if you want to put it that way? Yeah, I, w I worry about this one, Nicole, because um, I, I mean, you know, Andy suggested what he was saying was maybe tongue in cheek, but there's there's some truth to that sort of binary nature. It's you know, you're either good at governance or you're not, and and would the CP want to be reporting on that in a competent person's report? What what would the purpose of that be? And if the judgment was that the, the company was failing at governance. Well, what's the implication of the modifying factors? Well, it's, it's, it's a loss of your license to operate. You don't have reserves. <laughs> I, I, I just struggle to see this being practically used um, in a CPR for the purposes of mod modifying factors. That's not to say that it's not important and there shouldn't be some reference to it, but I just don't see how we as CPs can, can practically use that. Yeah, I agree 100%. You know, the CPR, in my opinion, is definitely not the place for it. And you know, reference to it, yes, 100%, it's, it's, an, it's an important factor, but I think in our space, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit, but uh, you know, out of our depth, I think, to, to have to then, in addition, deal with those things. So, um, agreed on, on that one. But do you not think that these are issues that could actually be raised in your risk report? I mean, often general governance issues, um, and even legislative issues, if legislative issues actually fall under, under the governance, are generally raised as risk. Sometimes you can't quantify it, but it is raised as a risk. If you raise it as a risk, at least the, the shareholder or the investor is informed. Yeah, I would agree with that. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, I guess I want to put a, a question out there that with respect to, to governance, is our nervousness and everything about it because we are either geologists, mining engineers, or, or a few of us um, environmental social practitioners, but there are people that understand governance issues, uh, particularly this concept of risk that Teresa and the others have, have talked about. Um, and, and, and maybe the question is, should we be pulling in um, governance risk specialists as one of the resources that we rely on when we're doing CPRs. Just like we pull in ES, uh, environmental and social specialists, uh, processing engineers, etc. Tanya, you had a comment on that one? Just on that, remember that CPRs are not only written for large companies. We've spoken at length about the, the needs of the smaller company. If we have to bring in specialists from all walks of the, the earth, smaller companies are never going to be able to compete with that financially. So we want to be very careful as to what we think we need in and who's going to supply it and who's going to pay for it. 
Yeah, I mean, is, is it not good enough that these things are dealt with in, um, you know, the the other reports? Um, you know, a lot of it is, is dealt with in the annual reports of companies, um, remuneration, those types of things. Um, you know, Jonathan said it in the, um, in the comments here that a history of non-compliance and legal action may indicate issues with governance. Um, you know, typically legal issues are, are covered in um, annual reports and, and, and such. So, you know, I believe that, you know, as technical specialists, you know, who are building these documents, it, it's definitely not necessarily anything in, the, in our scope. And I believe we, we should then rely on, as you say, the other, the, the people who are experts in this, um, looking at your, your risk registers and those types of things um, dealt with elsewhere, not necessarily in CPRs. Um, you know, I don't believe that there's a place for, for that specific topic in, in a, a CPR specifically. Yeah, Nicole, it occurred to me that, I mean, we do have the King 3 and the King 4 codes of, of uh, corporate governance. And maybe there are aspects in there that can be incorporated into the ESG guidelines, which will then provide direction um, for matters of governance and how to, let's call them qualitatively, assess the level of compliance. And I'm not saying talk about um, that it does or not, but maybe on a scale of one to three, how well they're doing or, or something of that nature. But certainly that may be a way to, and, and is an existing body of information that we can tap into. Agreed. And I think something else that, you know, that, that I just thought of now and, you know, the discussion earlier with um, Keith and Kelly is that, um, you know, these things could have the potential to um, have a financial impact on the line. Um, but, but how do you then say, um, you know, for example, if we look at sort of anti-corruption and those things, how, how do you put a number to it to say that, you know, if, if this goes wrong, down the line, this is how it affects your um, resource and reserve at a later stage. You can't necessarily chop some of your reserves off um, because you know you expect inherent corruption down the line. So I think that's maybe the discussion that that needs to to follow is um, number one: where is the correct place to to deal with these issues? How does it roll into um, you know technical evaluations? And how can you then you know in sort of future looking statements say that how would this affect um, your your resource and, and your reserve statements and your your annual research statements um, in in terms of you know what how, how it would modify them essentially if if we put it that way. Uh, thank you. I'll try to articulate my mind as best I can, but I'm obviously nowhere near uh, the rest of you. Um, something that popped into my mind was when we consider Jonathan's uh, mention of a history of non-compliance and legal actions is they are a step in the right direction, but they also have some limitation. So for example, a non-compliance could extend over a long period of time. So let's say you're non-compliant with a, a water use license condition. Um, that's not to say that you're deliberately sidestepping your obligation. Uh, you may have every intention to um, carry out the action you need to, but there may be some limitation beyond your control, whether it be money, whether it be uh, a skilled professional that you need, perhaps you're waiting for machinery that's passing through customs. And so it starts moving into a gray area where it's, it sort of becomes a condoned non-compliance. And then similarly with a legal action is that uh, very few people I would imagine would uh, deliberately and knowingly step out and, and act in a way that's uh, contra to what they should be. Um, and it becomes a, a very gray line. So often you see when you read legal, uh, documents is that two parties had uh, opposing perceptions on a common event. So it would be difficult for the CP then to, without staking their own uh, reputation on saying which is the correct interpretation of something that's going wrong or something that's being decided in the courts. And as, as a closing uh, sent sentiment, I would also be curious to see how it might play out is uh, imagine a hypothetical situation where a competent person prepared a report uh, through whatever mechanism said um, the ESG governance is very good, uh, hooray, hooray, and that company were to, in a later year or years, uh, be shown to be um, villainous, having done some atrocious thing, how it might come back then and then discredit either the person, their institution, or the collective uh, professional organization. That's it from the peanut gallery. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. 
I think, it, you know, if I pick up in terms of just your, your first comments about sort of condoned um, non-compliance, if you will, I think it's important there that, that the company demonstrates that there is some mitigation factor, you know, specifically with, with water use licenses, you know, that is a tricky one. And I think as long as you can demonstrate that um, you have some mitigation um, in place, um, eventually you will have to deal with that, that issue, whether it be a long-term or a short-term, but, you know, it, it's important that these things are disclosed, um, that, you know, your plans are, are put forward, that you're transparent about that, and that th there's an understanding in terms of the delays, if any, um, for implementation to, to fix those problems. So thank you for, for that comment. Kevin? If we're going to go on to this transparency page, um, fairly left wing, but maybe within the competent persons report, um, there's an analysis when it comes to per mine analysis as to whether reserves or resources are at risk. If we're mining in a country which is heavily going into resource nationalization, and there's an expectation that the um, legislation and whatever is gonna pass within five or six years, then shouldn't we be notifying investors that these are the reserves we think we're going to mine in the next five or six years. But given the resource nationalization, this element of reserves, there's an element of uncertainty. It still qualifies as a reserve because it depends on what happens with the resource nationalization legislation. So it's, it's not a resource, but we want to put you on early notice. That type of disclosure would be very useful to investors, but I don't think it's anything we see at the moment. I don't know if any of the panelists would like to pick up on that one. Um, just in terms of disclosure of, you know, the, the political situation of, of a country, um, typically those things are dealt with in CPRs. Um, so there is some discussion regarding that. Um, and it's dealt with extensively in, in terms of um, the, 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 the risks. So it, it'll definitely be picked up as a, as a material risk. Um, should there be something like like that coming up? So um, yeah, I don't know if any of the panelists have any other sort of comments on on that point. Um, I think Nicole, as I said earlier, I think the focus should be on materiality. Um, so if it's something like this that we know is going to affect your resources and reserves, and you need to de declare it as a risk, um, uh, it's, 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 it goes back to, to to transparency risk and also focus on materiality. Nicole, I was trying to get to the point. Not that we tell people it's a risk, but we actually quantify how much it's a risk. So if it would constitute 40% of the current declared reserve, people get told that, as opposed to, okay. the way there's resource nationalization, so we don't know what's going to happen. You know, are we going to operate in the, well, we let you know, but did you let me know that it constituted a 10% or 40%? Because those have different investment risks to me. Look, I definitely think if, 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 if that type of thing is a risk to your, your company or your reserve and resource base, that you would have yourself run those calculations. Um, whether you, you disclose that or not would be your decision. Um, you know, as you say, from an investment perspective, investors want to know those types of things. And if you've raised it as a risk um, and it's a material risk, like I said, you know, the company would have done those, those analyses to, to see what the, the effect would be. Um, so where where that that would be um, put forward in terms of taking it out of saying so much of your, your reserve base could potentially be be affected. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't have the answer to that. Kelly, do you have a comment? Yeah, well, I just think we've got to we look at it in terms of materiality. If you want your CPR to be competent in terms of both Samrec and Sambel, you have to comply with the principle of materiality. So if something is as significantly material as, as taking away 40% of your reserves, um, then it actually needs to be disclosed. Um, and particularly if it's going to affect your valuation quite significantly, it has to be disclosed. Otherwise, your valuation could be deemed incompetent. Um, and whether it's 10% or 40%, you really should be quantifying it because probably both in my mind are probably relatively significant or material. 100%, Andy? Yeah, the problem when it comes to governmental matters, and I'm talking government rather than governance, is that if you start talking about 
future legislation or uh, governmental noise in terms of resource nationalization, et cetera. We've had lots of rhetoric in South Africa of expropriation without compensation and all similar sort of things that have been going on for years, but nothing has materialized. And to, to now try and take a stab as to when that, is, when that could materialize um, is, is, is way, I mean, we don't even get involved in doing metal price forecasting. So how are we supposed to be able to predict or forecast when government is going to sign new legislation into, into being? It, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult um, thing to predict. But again, Andy, as you would do with metal price forecasts, I've yet to see a valuation that doesn't have as their, their first risk is the uncertainty in metal, in metal prices. So same in terms of other ESG issues, it could be raised as a risk. You're not necessarily quantifying it, but you are raising it as a risk. So the, the investor is still informed. Yeah, Kelly, you're right. And Nicole did, did refer to that, that um, it would be included in your risk discussion as to I mean, the governmental factors is always a risk that uh, is, is highlighted in any, any competent person's report. Yeah, and I think we need to be careful as well. Um, I mean, I hear what you say, Kevin, but I think you also don't necessarily want to spook investors. I mean, it's something that's entirely out of your control. Um, you know, that's why you raise it as a risk. And, and whether you, you, you've you quantified it as, as a company or not, I mean, typically you would have done that, that evaluation. But I think if you disclose too much sometimes, it it can also work against you. So I think it's, it's, it's again, just a fine line with, what you just you know too much can be too too much of it too much can create problems as can too little um so it's that that fine balance as to you know what what you disclose and what, what you don't nicole totally on your page totally agree hindsight is an exact science um it's just that if we're looking at governance and not just governmental factors we need to cons we need to act not from you know from wearing two hats we have to look from the professional skepticism of being am i providing the right information to the corporate in my role as a, a competent person and also but am i not must i must also be making sure i'm not assisting the corporate in not disclosing material relevant information and it's finding that fine line which is a very difficult line to treat mm -hmm when you're an employee in in how to work both sides of that angle for sure but i don't think as cps that's our decision to make at the end of the day you know what what's material in terms of that yes if it affects your resource and reserve uh definitely but um you know in terms of the materiality of a risk um i think that sits outside of of our scope of of expertise um just in terms of that kelly or Andy. <coughs> Yeah, yeah just, uh, just picking up on what Kevin was saying, um, it's an ongoing, ongoing saga that we have with, with clients when we're doing, when we're compiling competent persons reports because by nature, we as consultants tend to take a more jaundiced view of what's, what's happening and report it in negative parlance, if you like. And then the company comes back and says, but this is too negative, can't you make it more positive? And it's getting the balance between what I can call half empty, half full glass. To still say the same, make the same comment, but to maybe put it in a way which doesn't completely crucify the situation, and, but it still gets your point of view across. Kelly? Sorry. Yeah, I think um, Andy hit the nerve on the head. Okay, I think if there are no other comments on governance, I think let's, let's move on from this one. Um, I see the, the time is, is running now. Um, so, you know, we've had quite an extensive discussion about what should and shouldn't be included in our, and I think this will definitely need to, to go to a workshop. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, just looking at the, the survey and, you know, expectations from that is that there is some expectation or, or should I say a wish list that, you know, in, in the next update that there is a lot more guidance, um, you know, perhaps if, if, if it's split um, similar to, you know, alignment with the other codes in terms of um, being an exploration project, you know, the different levels of study, 
Um, but then you also have the, um, the added complication of, you know, we have different reports. So there's the annual report, there's the CPR. You know, do you go to the level of breaking it down as to what is included in those reports? Or is it just applicable to the different levels of, of study? Um, thoughts on, on, on this one? I think, Nicole, the, the first thing that uh, needs to be possibly clarified is that for the corporates when they're doing their annual resource and, re and reserve reporting, um, the, the resource and reserve report that is, that is generally filed on, on your websites is, is a very comprehensive document but in itself doesn't necessarily have to be supported by a full competent persons report. If, however, you're only putting in, well, if it's a new listing, then you would have to have it uh, generally. But um, where you have maybe just a very brief summary in the integrated annual report, that would then need to be supported by possibly a competent persons report. Either way, the reporting still has to satisfy the requirements of the SAMREC code. And the JSC rules are very specific in terms of the disclosure requirements in an integrated annual report or your annual reporting cycle uh, as against, as compared to uh, a competent persons report, uh, the level of disclosure is very different and, and is, is clearly set out in the rules. Yeah, I mean, a comment from, from Neil in the, the chat I'd like to pick up that's, you know, Obviously, everything we've discussed, um, there are places for these particular topics, you know, government, those types of things. But, you know, as he stressed, the, the CPR is at its core technical report. Um, ESG certainly is a modifying factor and addressed only to the extent that, it, extent that it may affect the estimate. And that's what we're saying is you don't want to bog down these reports with too much additional information that's not even relevant. You know, how we need to decide how the ESG factors um, influence um, the estimate um, negatively or positively, um, focus on those particular points and, and show that you have an understanding of them. Um, and then, as we said, is, is reference other reports um, for things that are out of our expertise. Don't know if there, anyone has any other comments in terms of what, um, what we feel should be included and, and should not, other than what we've, we've addressed now. I would just add that, uh, you know, Kelly's suggestion around um, more detail in the risk register makes a lot of sense because it's not, it's not our attempt here to ignore ESG. Um, indeed, we, we, we apply it where it's, where it's practical to do so, but where there are those sort of unquantifiable aspects, they should still be acknowledged in some way. And that can be included in, in the CPR in terms of a, of a risk register because we do need to protect the lay investor as well. Um, and that would probably be the best place to do that without having to take a view, uh, whether that's a legal view or a specialist view, there, there is some documentation of that. You know, and to your point, Neil, you know, and, and we discussed this is that, you know, some of the, some of the corporates obviously have these integrated reports where, where everything is included and you can reference or, or point them to, to specific documentation. But we go back to the one size doesn't fit all is that, um, you know, the juniors or depending on the level of, of study of the, the, the project or mine may not necessarily have those documents to fall back on. And I think that's why it's important that they're, they're given the guidance as to, you know, what they should include in their, um, you know, their CPRs or their annual reports or, or other documentation that they do put together. You know, is it necessary to have a separate ESG report in those particular instances where, you know, that they cannot reference um, other documents, um, you know, how, how, how does one deal with, with, with that, that particular one? Um, you know, if, if you have it, it's nice, you can, you can refer to it, but if you don't, you know, you, you're not going to spend the money necessarily to, to go and recreate things or reinvent the wheel. So um, that's, that's also, you know, a, a, a tricky one is that, we obviously want to keep to a minimum um, what's what's required in, in specifically the technical documents. But if you don't have those other documents to draw on, um, where would you, where would you put those those issues? Where would you raise them? Is the CPR the right place for that? I don't know if there's anyone on the the chat that you know maybe has that experience. Is that you know your company or, or, or if you're a consultancy that you know has to draw on these reports. Um, you know, where would you typically source this, this information? Would you go to the CPRs? Would you go to the resource reports? Um, 
where would you source this information or where would you expect to find it if it's not available in sustainability reports or, or, or those types of reports? No ideas on that one. Okay. I think let's let's move on. Um, so in terms of you know things that we haven't covered, um, and there's quite a bit of discussion in terms of the ESG specialist and the role of the CP in, in ESG. Um, you know, who, who's ultimately responsible to ensure that those matters are, are covered? Um, is it the CP that takes responsibility for his or her report? That those you know matters are included there and and sources on the uh, technical specialists to to ensure that those are included. Um, I think let's let's have a bit more of a discussion on on, on that because there's been quite a bit of um, you know discussion in the chat specifically on um, you know who's responsible for for these types of matters. I think I'm just going to go to the chat just to see one or two comments in terms of that. Yeah, so, so Tim put earlier is that um, how do we define and provide professional accreditation to an ESG expert for technical reporting? And, and do we believe that that's, that's necessary? Um, is it necessary to have an ESG expert? Um, or, or, or can the, the CP take on that role, um, not necessarily being an expert, but ensuring the compilation of the information and the reporting of that, that information? Nicole, I'll just make a, a comment on that. I've, in presentations that I've done with my SAMES cat on, I often depict the, the competent person as the conductor of an orchestra. Um, you know, the, the, the CP sort of needs to, to make sure that everybody is, is doing their jobs and playing their instruments well and, and, and bringing everything together. And there obviously has to be a, a sense of trust and reliance that, that each of the musicians you know, knows how to play their instrument correctly so that they all play the same tune. And I think we've had discussions on the chat and, and during the last few days around what makes the competence of a CP. Uh, and, and I think all of this boils down to the fact that it's the CP needs to be competent in that role. And there's so many facets to that. So you can't expect them to be an ESG expert. However, if you're a small mining or a small exploration company, you are you are that person. You, you you are the ESG expert because there isn't anybody else. And so, how do you balance that need and, in many instances, the desire to fill those roles with the actual abilities um, to do so? So I'm not really answering your question. I'm sort of just painting the challenge that exists. Um, is that there's the, the CP has to draw where they can and where they're lucky enough to have these different people to offer their expertise. Um, but in other instances, they have to do the best they can based on the information that they have available to them at the time. I think that's the key point, um, is that essentially, you know, it, it, you have to compile the information. It has to be disclosed. And, you know, if you don't have the understanding yourself, you, you need to draw on those technical um, experts. And I think... Um, you know, Tim said it in the previous session is that, you know, he relies heavily and I see his hands up. So maybe you can um, elaborate on that, Tim, again. Yeah, Nicole, I, I would say uh, one of the, the things I've learned and it's become particularly effective is uh, in the normal uh, annual process of uh, resource and reserve reviews uh, in goldfields, I've wired uh, ESG very much into that process uh, and the ESG practitioners are onboarded from the outset when we do our resource reserve reviews. So they're, they're part of the journey as we go through the resource uh, and life of mine reviews, the mine planning assumptions, key rationale, input, et cetera. So by the time we start consolidating the information from uh, a dozen or so assets across the group and across the world. We've already fully onboarded ESG and early on in the piece, any issues or red flags uh, are spotted and dealt with early on. So by the time we get to taking the r, &R estimates through to the executive and ultimately to the board's audit committee, we've act we're actually across those issues uh, and we've dealt with them early on. So it it's a case, I think, of onboarding ESG to be very much part of what traditionally has been a technical and financial review, but make sure they're very much part of it. And uh, yeah, I, I think that's the way it's worked well uh, in our company. 
Thanks, Tim, for that comment. And that's, you know, that that's actually a very valid point is that I think a lot of times, you know, whether it's a project or a mine or, or whatever it is, is that, you know, these are almost afterthoughts. They're not part of the initial um, d discussions or, or the, the technical discussions that happen. So as you say, you know, as we collaborate with um, the mining engineers and the geologists and, and the metallurgists, you know, we should be bringing those environmental and social um, people in, you know, those technical experts as, as part of the team that, that build, um, build the picture. So, you know, a, a lot of times I think we're, we're actually caught on the, the back foot. I mean, I'll just use an example on, you know, projects that we've worked on before. Um, you know, you go through the entire project, the mine design, everything's done, everything's checked off, and then you realize you have a, a, an environmental issue which delays the project. So, you know, if, if they're brought in right from the onset, um, you avoid those types of problems. So, so thank you for that. That's a, that's a very good idea and a good comment in terms of incorporating it right from the beginning. Andy? Yeah, I mean, we, we currently do have the environmental and social specialists involved in, in most um, review work that we do, in fact, all review work that we do. Your environmentalists invariably are registered as an environmental assessment practitioner, so it's an EAP, and um, some of our um, environmentalists are actually registered as a national uh, PRCINAPS uh, in terms of SACNAS. So there, there is a place for, for them. The social scientists, sometimes the same way, also registered via SACNAS. It's the governance issues which remain a problem and the only way we can really deal with those is, is, is properly describe those in the, the risk register. And that then also begs the question is how much detail do you need to include in the risk register or the discussion leading up to the risk register to properly elaborate what those uh, risks uh, con uh, consist of? I mean, I think I'll pick up on your point in terms of the, 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 the risks there. Um, you know, when we were building our technical report summaries, there is specifically a section on, on risk. And, um, you know, in terms of disclosures of those risks, um, obviously the, the major ones or the, the material issues are, are, are what you, you put down there. But again, it comes down to, you know, what, what you determine as, as material may not be seen as material to investors or vice versa. Um, so you would definitely have to have um, somebody advising you on, on that type of, um, you know, that perspective. In terms of the risks, um, is, is I suppose rating them um, and, and, and having some rating or, you know, the scorecard system that they use in terms of looking at those risks to, to, to try and assist you from a technical perspective, what would be material and what you would have to disclose and the the level of disclosure for, for those risks. So agreed 100%, that's, that's a good way to go about, you know, that particular issue. Not sure if anybody else has anything to raise in terms of, um, you know, the CP's role in, in ESG or, you know, bringing in technical specialists. Okay, it seems we have no more hands on that one. Nicole, so essentially, yes, sorry. sorry, Andy. Just one more thing. There was a time years ago where the company could be the, the named competent person with a number of people that had been contributing to the team effort. And then the, the tendency was to be to move away towards named competent persons for um, resources and reserves. And in fact, if you look at NI43101, they actually require that every single chapter uh, a person is states as to who they were respons uh, responsible for which part of the report. So you you kind of swinging um, the pendulum is swinging the other way. I understand that in terms of SK thirteen hundred that it is possible for a company to take the re the role of the qualified person, um, or take the responsibility for the report with a number of qualified persons signing off the report. So it's, it's something else that possibly needs to just be considered. Yeah, and I mean, I know there was some, you know, in, in particularly in the survey is that, you know, do you, and, and it is brought up in the guideline in terms of, you know, an ESG specialist. So, you know, do, do we go to that level where we, we have that as an additional sign off? Um, is it necessary? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't have the answer. Um, I think while we're we're still on sort of more a general discussion, you know, I'll pick up a point from Jonathan in the, the chat is that I think a lot of what's happening around ESG now is is education.
and you know awareness and making people aware of ESG and I think someone said it earlier is that it needs to become part of your your company culture you need to drive ESG as you do grade quality tons you know all of those other aspects um, because if, if if it's driven from a corporate level and you know the the awareness is there um, it it will become part of your your day to day work. It, it, it's not necessarily going to be a standalone thing that you quickly need to comply to. Um, so I think it's important that you know those of us that you know maybe do understand a little bit more more involved in the ESG is that you know talk about it, um, raise it in in your your meetings and those types of things, and you know continuously um, bring awareness to it. You know, it, it was dealt with in the surveys that a lot of people, you know, weren't aware of the, the SAMES guideline, um, what it is, what it means, what it does. So I think that, you know, there's definitely a drive um, from everybody that um, we need to raise awareness. Um, we need to, to incorporate it in our, in our daily lives, in our daily work lives. And it needs, you know, be part of the, the team and the as Leslie says in, in the chat, it's, it's a team activity. You know, there's a number of specialists that come together. Um, it's, 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 it's all the different aspects that need to, to collaborate. It's not a one-man band, essentially. So, um, you know, all these different inputs are important. They're, they're crucial for disclosure. And I think if, if you come together as a team, there's no way that, that you can, you know, omit something that's, that's important. Um, everything will be, will be picked up. So I think we have um, two minutes uh, left in this um, this session. If if we have any any other questions or, or comments, anything in the the chat that anyone would like to raise in addition. Okay, I think that's it from us. Um, thank you for the good debate, the good discussion, and um, yeah, that's that's it from our team. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nicole. Thank you to to all your panel. Um, I'm going to hand over to Tanya to, to wrap up the session, but thanks very much for a, a really good discussion session there. Tanya, over to you. Thank you. Just to confirm that you can see my presentation screen. Yes, we can. Yep, it's all good. Okay, great. Well, thank you everybody for the, the wonderful discussion that we've had the last two days. What I've tried to, to do in this section is to collate the issues that have run through all the various discussions. It's impossible to, to note down all of the, the things of importance, but what I've tried to do is to pick out the things that run through each of the, the discussions. So, for example, and Ken, um, Tim, I've stolen your elephant. I think he is too cute. ESG is not going to go away. So we need to figure out a way to make it work. That reporting isn't only for compliance, but it adds value. It's obvious that there is significant confusion as to the reporting of ESG matters. What is a sustainability report? What is a, goes into an integrated annual report? what goes into a CPR. There's also limited awareness and understanding of, of SAMESC. And there's very much a need for practical direction, guidance, and clarity. Spoken about integration and standardization, which also comes out, we need greater in integration between SAMREC and SAMESC. What is the, the role of Crisco in all of this? Is it the cart or is it the horse? How do we deal with social media? And one point that has come out very loud and clear is that one size doesn't fit all. We have the, the junior companies, which have very different requirements and abilities than the larger companies. <clears throat> Various project stages all have different requirements. Does all of this ESG information need to be part of the SAMREC code or a separate guidance document such as SAMESC. A comment made on numerous occasions is how do we keep our reporting documents short? Materiality versus data dumping, I think has been a, a very interesting comment. What do we want to prescribe? 
Do we just prescribe something and it's completely irrelevant for your particular organization? So just how much guidance does SAMESC need to, to provide? Then <clears throat> another issue of competence, competent persons with respect to, to ESG. How do you define your ESG? E, as we've spoken about, is generally very easy. How do we deal with S and G? But I think that, that Leslie made a very pertinent comment that reporting is a team activity, doesn't devolve down to one individual. We discussed lots of issues around governance. Many questions were raised there about what, if anything, should be included. Issues of overlap between ESG and other reporting issues. It's a waste of everybody's time and energy to report the same thing in three different places in a CPR or an annual report. And again, the fact that a CPR is not a sustainability report. And Neil made a very pertinent comment that the CPR is at its core a technical report with ESG as a modifying factor and should be addressed to the extent that it may affect the estimate. The difficulty is going to be deciding what is that level? So what do you need to do? Well, if you wish, you can join the, the SAMES committee to assist with, with all of this going forward. Please send a mail to Teresa, Camilla, or myself, if you wish to be put on the, the list to, to join the, the, the committee and continue these debates on an ongoing basis. The GSSA is also in the process of forming an ESG interest group which we hope will grow into a specialist division of the, the GSSA. That's the, the contact email if you wish to be kept on this, or, or put rather on this um, mailing list. There is also a survey, Survey Monkey survey, if you wouldn't mind um, answering. And sorry, Tanya, that email address for the the interest group, it should be info at GSSA-ESG. Not Sorry. Really. There's just one S missing in that email address. Correct. Okay, so put two, two S's in there and you have it, have it correctly. Thanks, Teresa. Everyone will be sent a link to the recording of the, the two days of the, the inquisition. And you will also receive a copy of the... Um, the survey that we sent out a couple of weeks ago, the results of that will be sent to you for your information. And I'd like to thank all of the presenters for giving of their time and experience. And a special thank you for the international speakers, especially those from where the time zone was a little less than ideal. I want to thank also the, the meetings committee, namely Sarah, Fiona and Keith, for their assistance in putting it all together, and especially for Seth for Mark with his invaluable input into the survey. And I would like to acknowledge the hard work put in by the moderators of the three panels and all of their panelists. And finally, thank you to all of you delegates for joining us these last two days. Without your inputs here and your participation, both in the survey as well as in the ongoing discussions, this event will not have been a success. And I'd like you to continue your um, discussions with us in trying to find an equitable way forward for introducing ESG into public reporting. And with that, I need to say thank you very much. And we'll hope to see you again soon at another occasion. Okay, I'm going to close off the, the meeting now. Thanks everybody. Goodbye.